Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is a debate on motion number 11598 in the name of Richard Lockhead on food and drink. Could I invite members who wish to participate in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now, please? And I call on Richard Lockhead to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, around 14 minutes. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. <coughs> Food is something we all enjoy and often take for granted, and today we can reflect on its importance to Scotland and indeed to the world, because the world, of course, is changing. The world's population is expected to increase from 7 billion today to 9 billion by 2050. It is estimated that 12 per cent of the world's population, that's 842 million people, don't eat enough to be healthy. And by 2030, the world is expected to need 40 per cent more water and 30 per cent more energy. There is therefore pressure on our resources like never before. And globally, food is and will remain a critical issue. But here in Scotland, we are fortunate. We are blessed with some of the most amazing natural resources anywhere on the planet. Our land, our water, our seas all provide the foundation for the raw materials that underpin our fantastic food and drink industry. An industry that is now one of the fastest growing sectors in Scotland. But it was not always like that. Back in 2007, the Scottish Government started raising the profile of food and drink, and it does seem incredible today that there was no national food and drink policy back then. There was very little by way of a joined-up approach to growing an industry of huge economic importance like food and drink. This led the way to the first ever national food and drink policy for Scotland and indeed perhaps Europe, and we called that Recipe for Success, and it was published back in 2009. At its heart was the desire for active change. And since then, the policy has come alive by working with highly motivated and ambitious people all over Scotland, every level of society, and of course in the business community as well. And this focus has paid huge dividends. The industry's turnover is now £13.9 billion, representing the largest increase in turnover in Scotland, even outperforming oil and gas. And since 2007, there has been a 51 per cent increase in the value of food and drink exports and a 32 per cent increase in sales of Scottish food and drink brands across these islands. Initial growth targets were smashed an incredible full six years early. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, perhaps we should not really be surprised at the success when we think of Scotland's rich larder. Our Scotch beef and lamb are second to none, recognised by top chefs across the world. Our seafood, seafood from our pristine waters is acclaimed also worldwide. Our soft food, our fruit, our cereals, our vegetables and tatties are renowned for quality of taste. And that's not all. Scottish berries and oats are just two excellent products that provide particularly essential nutrients in our diets. For instance, Scottish porridge oats can help maintain normal blood cholesterol and control our blood sugar levels. And berries can provide an enjoyable and healthy addition to our diets, contributing to our five a day. And of course, in terms of drink, our whisky, our Scotch whisky, our famous Scotch whisky, continues to be a global phenomenon, shipping an, shipping an estimated 40 bottles per second every day. Importantly, this success story is evident at the local level, and local sourcing and the celebration of Scottish produce is also increasing dramatically. Indeed, there has been a 50 per cent increase in the number of farmers' markets in Scotland and 150 new local food initiatives in the last 10 years. And through our work with the Scottish Rural University College and our funding for a community food fund, we have already seen 73 projects in the last two years alone celebrate our local produce the length and breadth of Scotland. Yes. Stuart Stevenson. <clears throat> um, the document A Good Food Nation makes reference to developing a children's food policy. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that uh, training and giving opportunities to get access to good food is important for the next generation of consumers and that that will help drive the market as well as improving health and well-being across Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I think the, the member makes a good point. It is ironic that we have an access to fantastic nutritious food on our own doorstep that not enough people, particularly our children, are enjoying and have access to. And therefore, if we can make that happen, that will be good for our economy at the same time. But in terms of promoting Scottish food, we've seen a 50 per cent increase in Scottish products with protected food names since 2007, combined with an increasing interest where food comes from and local produce on our menus. 
And it's not just the people of Scotland who are increasingly seeking the quality food and drink we have, it's also visitors to these shores as well. And a recent visitor survey revealed that 49% of visitors cited trying local food as one of the top activities undertaken, while over two-thirds think that the quality of food is important when choosing Scotland as a destination. So the world wants what we have, but we can't rest on our laurels. We must build on this success and continue to identify new markets. It's amazing, but a recent supplier development programme, which cost less than £50,000, resulted in 35 Scottish food and drink companies benefiting from an additional £12.1 million in sales with one major retailer. So with initiatives such as these, there is so much more we can achieve. We must support businesses who want to grow their exports or to start exporting. And the £4.5 million food export plan agreed earlier this year is a, a groundbreaking partnership with government, the public sector and the private sector to support these kinds of efforts. It will direct our focus to priority markets and pool of resources to help industry fully exploit these massive opportunities out there. And indeed, I'm pleased to tell you today about two new additions to Team Scotland. The first two of our new full-time overseas food experts are now in post in Toronto and Japan and are getting on with their jobs. Uh, briefly, yeah. Sorry, Nigel. I'm Todd. grateful. I wonder whether the minister could confirm my suspicion that actually starting to export is far more difficult than carrying on, and that probably most businesses struggle to see an overseas market because it's just not what they've done before. Cabinet Secretary. Well, his suspicion may have some uh, grounds in that it, of course, is daunting for many businesses to get into exports, but those that have usually don't regret it and find it's a very lucrative marketplace. So that's why there's a number of initiatives in place to mentor and work with particularly small or major science businesses to get into the international marketplace. Now, of course, 2014 has already brought a huge boost to the reputation of Scottish food and drink. The eyes of the world were on Scotland and our food and drink didn't disappoint. We successfully delivered a fantastic offering at the Ryder Cup, the Glasgow Commonwealth Games and Homecoming 2014 as well. It's difficult to visualise, but over two million meals were prepared for athletes, officials, media, the workforce and spectators at the Commonwealth Games uh, alone. And with such vast volumes of produce, Glasgow 2014 set a new gold standard in delivering major events in Scotland in a sustainable way. Liam MacArthur. For taking intervention. Uh, he's right to point to the uh, resounding success of, of, of those events. Um, it's been suggested to me, however, that because of the sponsorship relationships that the Commonwealth Games had, the opportunities for uh, Scottish food and drink producers were perhaps more limited than, uh, th than we'd hoped earlier this year. I mean, perhaps you could comment on that. Cabinet Secretary, and I can give you some time back. Okay, thank you. <coughs> well, it, it was certainly the case we made huge strides with the Commonwealth Games and perhaps compared to every previous Commonwealth Games there was much more local food for, for sale and I've spoken to many Scottish companies that have benefited hugely from Glasgow 2014. However, it's also the case, as perhaps the members are alluding to, that in terms of the Ryder Cup, it was absolutely fabulous what we managed to achieve with the Ryder Cup, where there's perhaps more control for Scotland over some of these issues. But both platforms were used to maximum effect for Scottish food and drink and this country's reputation. And indeed, the legacy of 2014 was the Games Sustainable Food Charter, which was rolled out to the other major events, such as the Ryder Cup and Homecoming 2014, and will feature strongly in the 2015 Year of Food and Drink. And it's no wonder that Kate Devine, the Herald, called the Games Food Charter that we developed, the first of its kind, deeply impressive. That's why we're now going to encourage the adoption of the Food Charter for every event, every organisation, and hopefully one day every town and city in Scotland. And along these successes since 2007, there has been huge activity in other areas. Because food is not just about sales and profit, we have devoted unprecedented effort towards food education, helping young people understand the role food plays in their lives, ensuring they have the facts they need at their disposal to, to make informed choices for their future. We have also made real, real progress on health with the introduction of Supporting Healthy Choices, a framework of voluntary action for the food industry to encourage consumers to make healthier choices. And we are working to ensure the public sector is walking the walk and not just talking the talk. In 2007, food in our schools and care homes was estimated at 34%, sourced from Scotland. It's now estimated at just under half and is growing. That means the expenditure on Scottish food and drink by the public sector in Scotland is now nearly £150 million. 
And as well as pupils, we also want patients in our hospitals to enjoy good food. Scotland has led the way in the UK when it comes to developing and monitoring standards for judicial care and catering in our hospitals. We have made good progress, but we recognise there is also more that can be done to drive up standards. That is why we are now going to consult on whether nutritional and catering standards in hospitals should be placed in a statutory footing. So we are debating today what is an undisputed success story. Recipe for Success has, as they say, done exactly what it says in the tin. Scotland has some of the best food and drink in the world, and our reputation is world class. But yet there are areas of unfinished business. In part, this is about continuing to be ambitious for the industry, and we're not resting on our laurels. But my ambition is shared, I know, by leaders in the sectors that in ten years' time Scotland should be well known throughout the world as one of the best places for food and drink businesses eh, to be based. But more than that, there's something not quite right about our relationship as a nation with food. This presents a profound paradox, one which confronts me every day of my life, not just as a, a minister with responsibility for food, but as a member of the public and indeed as a parent as well. We may be world beating in terms of food quality, but unfortunately, we're also beating much of the world in terms of diet related ill health. The average waistline for Scottish men, for instance, is growing by two inches in a decade, and two thirds of Scots continue to be overweight or obese. And in current trends, obesity is set to cost Scotland £3 billion by 2030. Food and vegetable consumption is in the poorest 20 per cent has fallen by 20 per cent since the recession. And it even goes wider than that. It is also about waste, where we still throw away about a fifth of all the food we purchase. That costs Scots over a £1 billion. Pounds. So we can learn a lot from recycling of food waste, such as what happened in Glasgow 2014. And while too many of us are buying too much food and wasting too much food, too many of our fellow citizens can't afford to put food on their tables. And food poverty in 21st century Scotland is a scandal that we all have a responsibility to tackle. 820,000 people in this country are living in relative poverty. And everyone should have access to affordable, healthy food. We recently announced an extra million pounds over the next two years to help combat food poverty in Scotland. We want to make sure those using food banks as a result of the UK's welfare reforms are able to access appropriate advice and support. And our policy must also tackle ignorance, generally speaking, across the population about what lies behind what we eat and where it comes from and how it's prepared. We have to create a culture that attaches greater importance to our food. Today is not just about reflecting on progress, it's therefore about saying that we will no longer put up with all of these paradoxes. And that's why I'm committed to making Scotland a good food nation. Scotland is already well known as a land of food and drink, but we also need to become a land of food and drink known for the quality of the food we serve eat and sell day by day. It needs to become second nature that everyone in Scotland serves, eats and sells fresh, tasty food with sound, healthy and environmental credentials. We want everyone to know what constitutes good food and why. All players in Scottish life, from schools to hospitals, retailers, restaurants, the manufacturers, would be committed to serving such food. Now, we all know that becoming a good food nation will not be easy. It's a challenge that will require a commitment from all to change. It will take time, but the impact will affect future generations. The Scottish Government is fully behind this aspiration. It will be pursued with vigour under our new First Minister, reinforced by new powers, resulting from the current constitutional process. But above all, it will need a broad coalition for change involving many areas. That is why in June I launched the discussion document, Recipe for Success, Scotland's National Food and Drink Policy, Becoming a Good Food Nation. Its purpose was to start this next phase of the debate in this country about our food future. It sought people's views on what it would mean to be a good food nation, what steps would have to be taken, both locally, nationally, at grassroots level, and so on. The consultation process closed in late October. We are currently analysing the responses. We have to understand what people think about our food and drink culture. As a starter for 10, we think public food, local food, and children's food are the right areas to focus on more in the future. Of course, this will continue in tandem with our efforts on exports and economic growth, and these are not mutually exclusive aspirations. There will, of course, be other important issues. And to help us through these issues, we will shortly be ready to establish a, a Scottish Food Commission. It will have two roles, firstly advising on the key areas that need to be taken forward, and secondly advocating the importance of food to Scotland's health, environment, eco economy and our general quality of life. It is vital that we involve everyone from all walks of life for Scotland to become a good food nation. And that is why the work of the Commission will be supported by a network of local champions, the length and breadth of Scotland. I make no apologies for the fact, as I reach my conclusion, that becoming a good food nation is a challenge for us all. 
It won't happen in one fell swoop. It'll happen as we create together good food communities, villages, towns and regions, the length and breadth of the country. And there is no better time for this to happen than now. 2015 is the designated year of food and drink as part of the, the government's overarching, overarching tourism drive. That will provide further opportunity to showcase our fantastic industry, both at home and abroad, and get people engaged in the debate. A series of themes are being developed throughout the year, and I hope that businesses and people across the country will harness all the opportunities. So our food and drink sector is now well and truly in the spotlight, and now is the time to capitalise on the strength of our industry, its providence and the quality of our produce. Presenting officer, becoming a good food nation and creating a good food culture will mean that in 10 years' time, when Europe, or indeed the world, thinks good food, it thinks not only of Italy and France, but of Scotland as well. That must be our aim, and that is what we must achieve. So I commend the motion to Parliament. Many thanks. And I now call on Claire Baker to speak to and move Amendment 11598.1. Around 10 minutes, please. Um, thank you, President Officer. I'm delighted to be opening the debate for Labour this afternoon. This is an exciting time for the food and drink sector. And as the recent Bank of Scotland report demonstrated, we are seeing um, strong export figures in key markets, but we're also seeing a very positive approach across the whole sector with companies planning for the future. Um, that this success has happened at a time when there's been real economic pressure in other areas is a credit to all involved. And as we look forward to 2015, the year of food and drink, I do give credit to the government for working positively with the sector and promoting its importance in a modern economy. The success has come through increased partnership working with the Scottish Food and Drink Federation, Scotland Food and Drink, the Federation of Small Businesses, our FE and HE sectors, as well as key government agencies. Um, Scotland has a fantastic larder. We have many unique products which reflect our history and heritage that present opportunities for us to share with the world. Um, as a Pfeiffer, I'm all too aware of the excellent locally produced products that we have, and from pit and ream fish to puddle dub pork, Fife's food and drink is world class. It is a larder that many of us have grown up with, and it's one that is synonymous with quality and excellence. Reputation and trust is so important in the food and drink sector, and Scotland's brand is strong. We must do all we can to enhance and protect that. Our export sector is dominated by Scotch whisky, a Scottish and UK success story. It is the largest food and drink export in both of these markets. It's a significant product, it supports employment in Scotland, and it also opens the door for other products to come onto the international stage. Our food sector is led by another key product with demand for Scottish salmon and seafood growing significantly in recent years. Um, I want to see more products and companies able to build on these successes, moving into emerging markets and ensuring that our brand is able to grow beyond industry leaders and iconic names. And as we head into the year of food and drink, we must look to build on the year that we've just had. Um, a strong Scottish tourism sector can showcase our products on our own doorstep. And at the Visit Scotland event in Parliament last night, that was clearly demonstrated. We have seen excellent growth in visits to Scotland and our food and drink sector play a key part in that success. But we must also address the challenges in the sector and the country when it comes to food and drink. As the Bank of Scotland report highlights, producers are facing challenges from rising costs, integrity of the supply chain, food security and meeting global demand. But in a space of a year, we have seen the expected growth almost double. The potential within the sector is evident and we must now ensure that this potential is realised, even exceeded, and that the benefits, both economically and socially, are not just experienced by those in the sector, but also by the workforce and the country at large. And in a world that is seemingly getting smaller, we have seen advances in technology through um, shipping practices through to food preservation and the flourishing of countries and regions such as Asia, with its middle class expected to grow from just over 500 million to over 3 billion by 2030. We are seeing the emergence of new and exciting export markets for Scotland. We are seeing an increasing global interest in food and its providence. In tough economic times, we've seen the food and drink sector buck the trend and seen positive returns. So the opportunities for expansion are clearly there. The questions we must ask ourselves is how we create and maintain the conditions for the sector that will enable us to meet this potential. How do we take advantage of emerging markets and how do we ensure there's a legacy for the industry for years to come? Um, I very much welcome the export plan and the route map it offers and welcome the update from the Cabinet Secretary today. 
The proposals are practical, they're responsive, and I look forward to their imp implementation. Um, but last night, when I was at the Visit Scotland event, I was speaking to somebody from FSB who works with artisan producers in Fife. And when we look at the international food tr trends, we can see there's a lot of potential in these type of products, but we need a bit more support to grow their businesses. Issues that Nigel jo Don was raising. Some of these smaller businesses just need a bit of support to take the next step. Um, and these kind of smaller businesses can also provide additional benefits such as employment in rural areas, they support our local tourism section, they support innovation and increase Scotland's reputation. It's maybe an area that could do with a bit more focus. Um, when promoting food and drink and Scotland's reputation, we also need to consider Scotland's health record. We need to address our reputation, fair or otherwise, as the sick man of Europe. And I was pleased to hear the Cabinet Secretary raise these issues. Um, it signifies, I think, that the government have been lifted into concerns over the last few years, that the food debate has been a bit too narrow and we need a much more inclusive approach to it. Um, our obesity levels are far too high. And when it comes to 2030, when the sector we should be taking advantage of, the expected 3 billion members of the Asian middle class, at home it's estimated we'll be dealing with a 3 billion pounds cost in terms of tackling obesity. And it doesn't have to be that way. Um, our food and drink export policy has produced clear successes in economic terms, but I do welcome the expanded focus of the Becoming a Good Food Nation consultation, um, including the focus on children's diet that um, Stuart Stevenson raised. Um, there are challenges in producing an overarching inclusive food policy across government, and if it's to be truly inclusive, it's not just up to Richard Lockhead to deliver it. You know, I was pleased to see Michael Matheson supported the motion, but we need greater commitment from across government if we're to make progress in these areas. Uh, we need to make greater connections between food and drink as an economic driver with its importance as a public health issue. And with such a magnificent larder, with great export figures, quality on our doorsteps, we shouldn't be facing significant failings in addressing food poverty, poor health and obesity. We must find solutions to these challenges. And the Scottish Parliament has really led on public debates and policy around smoking and alcohol. We do need to now have a serious debate about food. Um, food in Scotland is an emotive issue. It's much easier to talk about the negatives of tobacco and alcohol. And when my colleague Richard Simpson spoke about a soda tax, which has been introduced in France, he got pretty negative press coverage around this, mainly seen as an attack on our national drink. And tax as a mechanism for changing behaviour is pretty challenging, but we need to have the space in Scotland to have the honest debate. And I welcome comments about the establishment of a food commission, which might help with this. It might provide the space for that debate to take place. Um, not only would we improve our citizens' health and life chances, but by improving Scotland's diet, we can en enhance our rep reputation abroad, supporting the message of a land of food and drink. Um, sustainability, alongside providence and traceability, is becoming increasingly important in Scotland and internationally. And Scotland does have a good story to tell in terms of um, good animal welfare standards and shorter supply chains. But it feels like the global food market doesn't always value that and that food and drink is an intensely competitive sector, which we've seen in recent years consolidations in Scotland through mergers and acquisitions. And recently we've seen the number of independent chicken producers fall in Scotland as the contracts with Scotland Two Sisters, so Hook Two Sisters were cancelled. But alongside the desire to promote local, we have to recognise the financial pressures that are on many families when it comes to food. And a bit of my own research, a pound of sausages, roughly 400 grams, at my local farmer's market cost me £3.24. Um, at High Street Butchers in my region, a similar weight of sausages cost me £3.18. In a big supermarket where they offer a whole range of differently priced sausages, a pound of their own brand pork sausages was £1.38. And that's quite a significant difference. And while there is clear evidence to suggest that a cultural shift would be a good thing for Scotland, we need to recognise that part of the debate must be about how we ensure low-income families aren't excluded from that debate. And when it comes to food safety, we must almost be vigilant. We're only too aware of how one food scare can have very negative consequences for a whole industry and take years, if not decades, to fully recover. Reputation is so important to maintain. The horsemeat scandal a few years ago did expose the complexity of the food market, the vulnerability there is to food fraud and criminality. And the news this week of bird flu in England is leading to, I think, for the consumer, um, pretty confusing um, reports about the risks there are to human health. Uh, we can't be complacent. But we also must have robust science to build consumer confidence and a good understanding of any threats. 
and currently the Parliament is consulting on a new food standards bill. This will create a new food body to take over from the FSA and establish new food law provisions. We should use this as an opportunity to have robust regulation for the food sector that will ensure consumer confidence and trust. And as the sector grows, it is important that it grows with a long-term high-quality workforce in place. For the benefit of the industry, for the benefit of our economy and our society, we need to attract future generations into the industry. And earlier this year, I visited a fish manufacturer who are based in West Lothian. And they sit on the boundary of Bathgate and Livingston, and they still found it extremely difficult to recruit young people from the local area to come and work for them. Um, and when we are facing real challenges around youth unemployment, there is an outdated perception of what working in the food sector is. And what I found there when I went to the, this fish factory was that they were um, fairly paid jobs, they were secure, secure jobs, they were jobs that were producing a high quality product. And we must do more to get young people attracted into that sector. We also need to ensure that future generations are gaining the relevant skills to be successful in the global marketplace. And while business programmes remain popular, Scotland is still pretty behind on language skills. Our approach to languages and education is still centred on the traditional languages. Uh, we must ask how we can reflect the modern workplace or the business world. And if we're talking about Scottish products moving into bigger export markets, um, you really need to have that flexibility and the language skills in there. And what I've seen when I've been to recent food and drink events is the growth in translation services, companies who are setting up to try and help companies make that expansion. Uh, we also need to see investment into research and new product development. Um, take Nairns, for example. I mean, you can't get a more traditional product than oat cakes, but they've diversified into gluten-free biscuits and crackers. And the US is now their most successful market, and gluten-free is its fastest-growing export range. So while businesses have a responsibility to invest, there's also potential for greater collaboration with our further and higher education sectors for bringing new products to the market. Um, so with that positive example, as we move into 2015, we can look forward to a year of celebration and raising the profile of Scottish food and drink. But we also have much work to do within this parliament if Scotland is to become truly a good food nation. Um, I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. And I now call on Alex Ferguson, around six minutes or so, please. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I, I'm it's usual in, in debates of this nature that as the debate uh, goes on and draws to a close, there's a degree of repetition takes place. Well, I'm sorry to say that here we are only in speech number three, and a certain amount of repetition is going to take place. Um, but I make no apology for that, because whatever our political or constitutional differences might be, I don't think anyone can take away from the undoubted success that the Scottish Government's policy on food and drink has been. Uh, very briefly, please. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, is the member not aware that political debates are not over when everything has been said, but only when everyone has said it? Alex Hicks. Um, I, I wouldn't, if, if Mr. Stevenson is accusing me of, accusing him of being repetitious, um, I, would, will, I will reserve judgment on that until later in the debate. Um, but not for the first time. I'm more than happy to applaud the government not just for recognising the potential of this sector, but for actually delivering the mechanisms and structures, particularly through recipes for success, that have allowed it to flourish over the last few years, even as other sectors have struggled with the economic pressures brought about by the worst uh, economic depression seen since the, in the so-called developed world since the 1930s. And it is a massive testament to all those involved in the food and drink sector that that is the case, from the smallest artisan producer to the industrial scale processors of some of our best known products. Because it's their efforts that have brought about the real success that is Scotland's food and drink, and we should all applaud them for it. But I think we should also recognise the role played by the organisation Scotland Food and Drink since it was established in 2007. Initially tasked, in its own words, with growing the value of Scotland's food and drink sector, making it more profitable and delivering greater global success in a challenging competitive market, it set about its task with such determination and focus that it has set a new goal of increasing the sector's turnover to 16.5 billion by 2017, having achieved its original target six years ahead of schedule, as the Cabinet Secretary noted. Now, if only every, every government initiative could boast that level of success, we would be living in a much happier world. But it's surely to the great credit of the management team at Scotland Food and Drink that this success has been achieved. And I note 
note with, with some sadness that Ray Jones, the chair of the organisation, is going to be stepping down from his role at the end of the month, I believe. Um, and I'm sure I'm not alone in wishing him well. The first minister's shoes are clearly not the only ones that will take some filling as 2014 draws to a close. The presiding officer, the figures that allow us to measure this success are indeed impressive, as the various briefings that we've received prior to this debate indicate. Overall sales of 13.1 billion in 2013, exports playing an increasingly important role, some 60% of Scottish companies looking to expand those overseas markets, food manufacturing growing by over 20% last year, a potential to create almost 10,000 new jobs in the sector over the next five years. Who could fail to get excited over figures, statistics, and prospects of that nature? And yet, there are concerns as well. The rising cost of new materials, sustainability and security of supply, the burden of regulation, the crucial need for innovation and improvement in food production, an area in which SMEs play such an important role. And there are other wider concerns, presiding officer. The export record and potential, as I think has already been mentioned, of farmed salmon is spectacular. But that industry continues to provoke serious environmental questions over matters such as sea lice and the shooting of seals that remain unanswered. And that leaves that sector just a little bit vulnerable while those questions remain unanswered. On another issue, I was horrified, frankly, to hear the RSPB saying in evidence at the Rural Affairs Committee just last week that it harboured serious concerns over its perception that too great a proportion of common agricultural policy support will, be, will remain targeted at the most productive areas of Scotland once the cap reforms are in place. Now, well, I would hotly contest that statement, as indeed would most of my productive agricultural constituents. But if we fail to support our productive areas, we could actually face losing the critical mass of some of our national products, such as our wonderful Scottish beef, and thus begin to actually reverse the huge successes that we are highlighting today. We can only maintain those successes by maintaining a balance in all of these issues. And next year, presiding officer, of course, will be the designated year of food and drink. Um, I, I very much welcome that initiative. I think it, it has great potential, but I would add a slight caveat. Alongside the year of food and drink, we will be taking forward the, the consultation document of becoming a good food nation. Now, I have absolutely no quibble with the vision that lies behind that consultation, although I have some sympathy with the NFUS that the vision might be more holistic than tangible and may prove difficult to measure. I hope they are wrong. But if we are truly to become a good food nation, then we have to tackle the fundamental problem that the Cabinet Secretary and Claire Baker have already mentioned. And it's one that I see vividly at too many secondary schools in my constituency in the shape of the fleet of fast food vehicles as close to the, door, the school gates as they could possibly get during the lunch hour. We all know the dreadful statistics on obesity, heart disease and other lifestyle issues that are all too common in Scotland today. And we all know the stress that our health services come under because of them. It has to be one of the great ironies that as we designate 2015 the year of food and drink and work towards becoming a good food nation, we are simultaneously and not terribly successfully trying to deal with a population that suffers from some of the worst dietary induced health problems in the Western world. So, presiding officer, in closing, perhaps, perhaps that should simply spur us on towards becoming that good food nation, because there is no doubt that the health and environmental benefits of doing so uh, are, are unquestionable. I have some reservations about the establishment of the Food Commission that the government proposes, but they are for another debate and another time, and I'm out of time. So for now, we on these benches would simply welcome the success of Scotland's food and drink sector. We wish it well in the future, and we'll be supporting both the amendment and the motion before us today. Thank you. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate. Six speeches of six minutes, please. I call Angus MacDonald to be followed by Alex Riley. Thank you, uh, President Officer. I'm certainly pleased to speak in today's debate uh, on food and drink, not least because, uh, as you can probably tell, I'm no stranger to the first-class food and drink Scotland has to offer. Um, the Cabinet Secretary did mention in his opening remarks that waistlines have increased by an average of two inches. Uh, in, in recent years. Uh, sadly, I'm well above that average, uh, but there's always hope, I guess, and, uh, of course, willpower. 
Um, I'm certainly pleased to see the Scottish Government's recipe for success has indeed been a success uh, since 2009, and I look forward to the Becoming a Good Food Nation initiative being rolled out in the future, along with the necessary wholehearted participation of everyone in Scotland. My constituency of Falkirk East and the wider Falkirk District plays its part already, and we can boast an impressive number of notable food retailers and producers. In Falkirk East, there are companies with international operations like Back of Our Caledonian Produce and Boness, eh, who produce ready-made salads solely for M&S, eh, using locally so sourced ingredients. And I also have the state-of-the-art White and Mackay bottling plant in Grangemouth. Um, now, the Cabinet Secretary will recall visiting Back of Our Caledonian Produce eh, following their further expansion in 2012, eh, and I hope he will also be available to visit White and Mackay's state-of-the-art bottling plant eh, at some point in the near future, as I have recently received confirmation from the CEO that the plant will remain in operation following the purchase by Philippines-based Imperador. Um, but my constituency is not just a home for industrialisation and big business. It is also home to a wide range of small food and drink companies and new starts like Grangemouth-based Caledonian Cheesecake Company and the Tablet Company, and a new whisky distillery outside Pullman, which was, was made possible by a generous grant from the Scottish Government. The Falkirk Distillery Company, which has a plant half-built at the moment, is expected to provide 86 full-time jobs and attract 75,000 visitors on the back of the world-class attractions of the Kelpies, the Helix and the Falkirk Wheel. When debating Scottish food and drink and the Government's plan for Scotland to become a good food nation, we must remember all aspects of our food heritage, good and bad, and acknowledge the impact these have on our culture. And of course, uh, Falkirk is famously the original home of Scotland's other national drink, Iron Brew. Uh, it is now produced in my colleague Jamie Hepburn's constituency, but originally produced in Falkirk around 1901. This drink is enjoyed by millions worldwide and is a true Scottish success story, but arguably it does not meet the healthy standards encouraged by the Scottish Government. Nor, I suspect, would one of Matheson's the Baker's legendary sausage rolls. They have been trading in Falkirk District since 1872 and are now based in Larbert, near Mrs Tilly's traditional Scottish confectionery and Malcolm Allen the Butchers. And with encouragement from the Scottish Government, Malcolm Allen's has produced a healthier burger and a lower calorie sausage and they sell over 1 million pies each year and over 20 million lawn sausages, eh, some of which I have to confess have been cons consumed by myself, eh, but purely in the interests of supporting the local economy. <laughs> eh, Pres President Officer, the, the list of successful food and drink companies in Falkirk District goes on, and this is one of the most industrialised areas in Scotland, right in the middle of the central belt. The food and drink industry in Scotland is in a very healthy position, and these good news success stories of companies, large, small, old and new, are in no small part due to the support of the Scottish Government through initiatives like Recipe for Success and the forthcoming 2015 Year of Food and Drink. However, there are challenges to overcome, and more can and should be achieved. As a former wholesale and retail butcher, I know firsthand that food and drink is an industry with a keen eye on price, and profit margins can be small, which can be challenging, especially when manufacturing, especially, especially with manufacturing, when supermarkets can negotiate ruthlessly and then take up to three months to pay out. But as we move into 2015 and launch the, the Year of Food and Drink, we must keep in mind that, by volume and value, Scotland has some of the largest protected food names in the EU, with high-value products such as Scotch beef and Scotch farmed salmon, eh, accounting for around £700 million in sales. Sadly, uh, revenue generated by Scotch beef and other Scottish red meat could be much greater if only Westminster Government could give Scotland a fair deal. Uh, members will recall my motion last year and the ongoing debate earlier this year regarding the red meat levy. It highlighted that the Prime Minister and the UK Government has refused to return the levy paid by Scotland's livestock producers who have cattle, sheep and pigs slaughtered in the rest of the UK. And this is believed to cost Quality Meat Scotland £1.4 million a year. Now, I thank the members that supported my motion. Uh, however, I was disappointed that it did not receive cross-party support. And red meat is not the only area of food and drink where Scotland would be better off if we could get a fair deal from Westminster. Scotland exports vast quantities of whisky around the world, and in particular to developing markets in the BRIC countries such as Brazil, Russia, India and China. These, experts, uh, uh, these exports of a product entirely made in Scotland with Scottish ingredients see over £4.3 billion going to the Westminster Exchequer. This, I believe, is a travesty that I am sure the Scottish Government will continue to work to correct. 
It is time for Scotland to stop hiding its light under a bushel and step forward to claim its rightful place as one of the world's best food and drink producers. Scotland's food and drink tourism industry is worth around £2.5 million per day, as we have heard uh, earlier on, and it is a market with great potential for growth, and one which I am sure the year of food and drink and becoming a good food nation will greatly improve. Um, sadly, uh, President Officer, I as always have more to say, but uh, as my time is running out, I um, will draw my comments to a close. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Alex Riley to be followed by Mike McKenzie. Thank you, President Officer. I am also happy to support the, the motion and support the, the um, proposals that are contained within this document. I also rise to support the amendment in the name of Claire Baker, and I hope we can um, have unity in the Chamber today as the amendment just, I think, adds to the motion, recognises the importance, as Alec Ferguson says, a £13 billion industry um, employing almost 400,000 people, um, and therefore there should be the opportunities for skills, for training, for apprenticeships, and that's what the, the amendment really highlights. Mr Daly, like, could I ask you to pull your microphone round I would slightly. like to highlight okay. perhaps uh, a few points. Um, in, terms of, in terms of health, um, and the importance of food and obesity. Um, I, did, I did hear it say and read recently that the impact on health is similar to that, that the impact the smoking was having. And as a government in Scotland, it was, it was agreed to take action, and, and rightly so, on smoking. And therefore, I think we do need to look very carefully, and this document starts to take us in that way. I should say, as a, a food grower, um, someone who enjoys my allotment up in Kelty, um, I, I think it's important we look right across government. The Community Empowerment Bill, for example, that's going through um, scrutiny just now, um, has a section on allotment. And I think there's, there's a lot more that can be done there. I certainly eat healthy for a big part of the year uh, and grow it myself, as, given, as well as, as, as giving it away to many other people. So there is a need for joined up government, and I like some of the ideas that is coming through. I read the briefing that came forward from the, the retailers, and you know, there is no doubt that the, the retailers um, are, are employing a lot of people and doing a lot of work. But I think we do need to look at food poverty. I was amazed to read that 3.9 million tonnes of food is wasted each year by the industry before it even gets near the shopping basket. Um, and, you know, at a time when we've got food poverty in this country, and if you consider the poverty that exists across the world, that, that, that is quite, quite scandalous. Um, Scottish homes throw away 630,000 tonnes of food and drink every year, most of which could have been eaten. The waste costs us up to a billion pounds a year, or £470 pounds for an average household. Now, local authorities have got to be a, a clear partner within this strategy, and local authorities are doing a lot of work. I know in Fife and my own constituency, um, you now have food waste bins, and that certainly brings it home to you as an individual when you see the, the levels of waste um, that, that is taking place. But we certainly have to do a lot more about that. We also need to recognise that in this day and age, food poverty is something that, that, that has to be tackled. The Scottish Government's own figures show that from April 2014 to June 2014, the Scottish Welfare Fund gave out £980,000 of grants for food. That is not relative poverty. That is absolute poverty. Somebody recently asked me what is poverty, and I said to them that absolute poverty is where you cannot meet your very basic needs. And it is a very basic need of every human being to be able to feed themselves. So if we look at the levels of waste that is taking place in Scotland, the levels of waste that is taking place through the large supermarkets before it even gets near the, the, the food baskets, and then we consider the level of waste that, that's happening within, within our own households, then, then we should not have food poverty. 
Food banks has not been mentioned yet, but the, the information coming from the Scottish Government is that 71,000, almost 71,500 people, including almost 23,000 children, were provided with food from a food bank in the last year. Again, you know, it just does not add up that we see the levels of waste that's taking place, we see the levels of poverty in our own country. So we need to address those issues. The submission on poverty from the, the fair share highlighted that there is enough food surplus in, Scottish, in the Scottish food industry to food, feed those suffering from food poverty in Scotland. And they call for joined up government and being able to do that. I would also, presiding officer, uh, want to highlight um, some of the positives that can be done in terms of partnerships with local government. The Fife Community Food Project, for example, which uh, operates in Fife and Moan constituency, there's a whole range of work with 16 plus um, low income families, family learning, homeless groups, mental health groups, people with additional support needs, and there's an excellent project um, at the local level that will address some of the issues around food poverty. In my own constituency, one of the, one of the youth workers, Lorraine Mullen, uh, is very actively involved in 10 week cooking skills programmes, working to ensure that people are able to um, get fresh products produce but actually be able to use fresh produce. So in conclusion, there are, there are major issues. The documents to be made welcome. We need to do more at a local level to ensure healthy eating and encourage healthy growing. But we need to tackle the obscenity that we have in the levels of food waste that is taking place in Scotland and elsewhere where we have poverty at home and poverty abroad. Thank you. I now call Mike McKenzie to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer. And I must start by complimenting the Cabinet Secretary for it's thanks to his ambition and his drive in implementing our food and drink policy that this sector has undergone a revolution since 2008. And this work has paid off beyond all reasonable expectations with growth and turnover of 14.4% between 2008 and 2011, the strongest growth of any sector in Scotland. And targets on turnover and exports have been exceeded with 51% growth between 2007 and 2013 and the value of food and drink exports. And by any standards, this is a remarkable success story. And I've had the opportunity of witnessing this amazing phenomena firsthand across the Highlands and Islands. And I've seen a huge improvement in both the variety and the quality of food and drink available. President officer, allow me to take you on a brief culinary tour of the Highlands and Islands, a two-day whistle-stop food fest. Arriving in Argyll via the gateway of Inverary, we could breakfast at Loch Fine Oysters and sample the amazing array of high-quality seafood and other foods available. And it might be best then to fortify ourselves with a dram in Campbellton, where the Springbank Distillery is the oldest family owned distillery in Scotland, and the only one, as I understand, still carrying out the full process on one site. And we should also visit their sister distillery, the Glen Gyle Distillery, the first of a number of new distilleries built in this millennium. And heading north, we could fortify ourselves further, if we needed it, with some fine Isla malts. And then on, on to Oban and lunch at the Eask. <laughs> Certainly. I, I, just wonder, I just wonder about the wisdom, giving legislation we, passed, we approved this week, of visiting two distilleries and then continuing to travel north. Mike McKenzie. I was assuming that neither of us was driving. So... But, but, and, and we should lunch at the East restaurant with a selection of great local foods available and prepared always to a very high and consistently high standard. But, and before leaving Oban, we should call in to speak to the in inspirational John Furteeth, who has performed a remarkable service for local producers and local caterers alike and helped launch brands like Argyle Venison as well as organising local food and drink trade shows. 
And now let's take the ferry across to Mull and sample some Isle of Mull cheese, some of the excellent biscuits produced by the Island Bakery, and some homemade chocolates at the Tobermory Chocolate Company. And at this point, presiding officer, being busy people, I suggest that we recruit the services of our friend and colleague Stuart Stevenson and ask him to fly us to Stornoway and sample some of the world-famous black pudding, now granted protect protected status by the EU. And then onwards to Orkney, where we'll be literally spoilt for choice of high-quality produce, from locally made crisps, cheese, ice cream and oatcakes, to the finest roast beef that I've ever tasted and the best steak I've had since one in ha I had in France a decade or so ago. Indeed, it's hard to find a butcher in Orkney that hasn't won a prestigious award for the quality of their meat. And after a meet uh, an evening meal, perhaps in one of Orkney's many quality restaurants, we could take the overnight ferry for Shetland. Shetland is a place for fish at which it excels above all other parts of the Highlands and Islands, but also for Shetland's wonderful oat cakes and cheese. For breakfast, I would recommend the smoked haddock and poached free-range eggs. I've never tasted better. And before we head for home, lunch in Frankie's fish and chip shop in Bray, and then a quick trip up north to the islands, island of Unst, to visit the UK's most northerly brewery, the wonderfully named Valhalla Brewery, for some of Sonny Priest's heavenly beer. Presiding officer, in the short time available, I have inevitably missed out more producers of excellent food and drink than I can possibly mention. There is much, much more to sample and to feast upon. In Scotland's high quality, locally produced food and drink add greatly to the visitor experience and therefore brings quality and added value to our important tourism industry. It adds to our exports, Scotland's exports being vital in shoring up the UK's balance of trade deficit. Local consumption of food and drink saves on food miles, helping reduce our greenhouse gases. Our healthy food contributes to our health and to our well-being, and the provenance of our food and drink enhances Scotland's brand worldwide. There is no doubt, presiding officer, that food and drink is a success story for Scotland. But the really good news is that we have barely scratched the surface. There is much, much more to be discovered. And it's hard to think of a part of the Highlands and the Islands, or indeed the whole of Scotland, where new producers are not emerging and recognising the added value in bringing their quality prod produce to markets both at home and abroad. For many years, we failed to recognise the many opportunities afforded by our wonderful food and drink. It's thanks to this government and this Cabinet Secretary that this is no longer the case. Thank you, Mr Mackenzie. I'm glad I managed to fit in lunch today. This debate would be agony. Liam MacArthur to be followed by Maureen Watt. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. After that, I think the chances of Mike McKenzie keeping his waistline um, to, to less than two inches in, increase in the next, uh, in next few months are, are very limited. And the, the advisability of at least three drams before lunchtime, I think, is open to question. But uh, like others, can I welcome uh, this debate? Can I also uh, very much welcome the Cabinet Secretary's sentiments, uh, not least, I think, in pointing up the paradox between the natural resources we have at our disposal, but still the, 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 the issues we face in terms of diet, and I include myself uh, very much within that. I think he's right, um, and we are all right to acknowledge the success uh, both of the government and of the uh, strategy. I, I think it would be slightly um, uh, disingenuous perhaps to adopt a year zero approach. I think uh, it is fair to acknowledge the work of my colleague uh, and his predecessor, Ross Finney, in developing uh, the strategy for uh, agriculture, which I think was almost a necessary precursor uh, before um, progressing with uh, this very valuable strategy on food and drink, and I'll maybe touch on that um, uh, later on. Uh, for those of us who were at the Visit Scotland reception last night, I think a demonstration, not just in terms of the interconnection between tourism and food and drink, but actually 
an indicator of the quality, uh, the confidence and the success that, that characterises the food and drink uh, sector. I see this very much on a local level, as Mike McKenzie was alluding to there. Again, I'll come on to that later. But at a national level too, uh, this is very, very evident. It's not difficult to see why. Uh, others have commented on the briefing from the Bank of Scotland that uh, I think illustrates the extent of that success against the backdrop of very challenging economic circumstances. We've seen the sector uh, weather the storm. The growth to 13.1 billion uh, last year uh, is in advance of what I think uh, all would anticipate being a very successful year through 2014. Uh, it is the largest manufacturing sector and looking ahead, it's a sector that is clearly ambitious to grow further, not least through the export market. And that is from the, the micro businesses and SMEs right through to the largest uh, manufacturers. So all very good signals indeed. But as I say, it's difficult to see how you would have a, a food and drink strategy without an agriculture strategy. And the NFU in their briefing uh, do suggest that without farmers, a good food nation simply would not exist. I don't think any of us would dispute that. The farmers and crofters across the country grow the crops, the fruit and vegetable, and raise the livestock, uh, which underpin uh, our food system. Uh, they're also working to improve the environmental and welfare standards. And I think, as Claire Baker was suggesting, uh, there's a hope that increased awareness amongst consumers about those issues will translate into uh, greater success for quality assured produce, whether through the Scotch beef, Scotch lamb, uh, the red tractor uh, marks or whatever. Uh, but there are challenges uh, too, as you would expect. Uh, in tough economic times, it's perhaps no surprise that consumers revert to buying uh, on the basis of, of price. Uh, and I think Alex Riley made a number of, uh, I think, very pertinent points in that uh, regard. One would hope that in terms of real wages starting to rise, that we'll see that, uh, that, that, that issue begin to be uh, addressed. I think the NFU have pointed to some concerns around the Food Commission, though we we'll wait to see some of the details there, a risk of potential duplication and overlap with other regulators and advisory bodies. Um, but there are challenges too for the, the retail sector. The actions of our supermarkets, as NFU make clear, can influence consumer behaviour, diet profiles and also the sustainability of supply chain. A good food nation requires sustainable pricing to be embedded in supply chains. Unfairness in the supply chain it not just hurts uh, businesses, but I think also uh, it runs the risk of stifling uh, investment. And I think the initiative uh, of setting up a, a grocery code of practice, uh, appointing an adjudicator, are welcome uh, innovations at a, at a UK level. Not, I think, to promote a, uh, a, 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 a sort of confrontational relationship uh, between retailers and, and primary producers. Uh, and actually, I think, hopefully, to encourage a, a more positive and constructive uh, relationship. And it would, I think, be wrong of us to lay uh, all of the blame at the door of the supermarkets. They help and promote and sell uh, I think upwards of £10 billion pounds of Scottish uh, food and drink into the rest of the UK, which remains uh, our largest uh, market. If I could turn um, briefly to the local um, situation, it is, I think, a microcosm of what's happening on a national uh, level. I would commend the work of Orkney Food and Drink and in particular the personal efforts of Edgar uh, Balfour. Uh, we've seen uh, awards, food and drink awards um, being initiated in Orkney and I hope that uh, will continue and, and celebrate the success locally. There are exemplars of top quality beef, lamb and seafood, Orkney cheese and ice cream to stock in oat cakes, fudge and Orkney preserves. We have Highland Park and Scapa Whiskey through to Orkney Brewery, and, uh, Orkney Brewery and Swanee Breweries. All award winners, all ambitious to grow and to meet the demand locally nationally and internationally. The Cabinet Secretary uh, was right to say that um, he would not be resting on his laurels and looking at what further support uh, could be provided. And I welcome that and perhaps could offer some examples. The high costs pointed up by the Bank of Scotland briefing uh, are all too ev evident as challenges facing Isles-based businesses. Transport and energy, as well as uh, poor broadband connections, come up repeatedly. In relation to ferry services, um, there are concerns that in terms of uh, Orkney producers, they aren't entitled uh, to access the, the, uh, the RET in the way that, uh, as uh, Orkney Food and Drinks, Edgar Balfour pointed out, Western Isles, we do not benefit from RET and find it hard to understand why there is a distinction between island communities. On air services, we've seen cuts to the air discount scheme. And again, uh, Orkney Food and Drink point out that the cost for Orkney Food and Drink businesses of doing business in the UK is expensive in any case, without making the first leg of the journey even more 
expensive, and therefore I think those are issues which the Cabinet Secretary may wish to reflect on and take on board. Postal services, we've seen warnings from the Royal Mail, which I think we need to take seriously. In skills, the amendment from uh, Claire Baker points to some of the issues that we face, not least in terms of uh, our, our young people or those of all ages attaining the skills to keep them in the sector, to raise the quality, but skills that they may need to go off island in order uh, to secure. On food labelling, uh, an issue that again has been raised by the Bank of Scotland, and perhaps I can follow up with the Cabinet Secretary uh, in due course. But in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, Locally and nationally, food and drink is a success story. It's one we should recognise, celebrate, thank and support all those across the sector who are achieving that. In the year of food and drink in 2015, and falling foul of the Cabinet Secretary's own paradox, I very much look forward to it, particularly Microbrewery Month. Thank you very much indeed. Many thanks. I now call Maureen Watt to be followed by Cara Hilton. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I too am pleased to be taking part in this debate this afternoon following on, as it does, from the very successful Visit Scotland event last evening, which focused very much on 2015 Scotland's year of food and drink. This has already had a very good kickstart by the high-profile events this year in terms of the Commonwealth Games and the Ryder Cup. Ms Watt, could you pull your microphone up? Thank you, pardon. Many thanks. thanks. I think the importance of this document becoming a, a food nation um, uh, to wider... Uh, I think the importance of this document to the whole of Scotland is ev uh, evidenced by the huge number of briefings which have been sent to MSPs in the last few days on this subject, and I thank all the organisations for these. Presiding officer, by any measurement, the Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Government are to be congratulated on the prominence that they have given to the food and drink sector in Scotland since coming to office in 2007 and publishing the recipe for success and now building on that. To many people, uh, Aberdeen in the North East is only known as the centre of oil and gas, but we are by no means a one-trick pony. Before oil and gas, agriculture and whisky were very much the mainstays of the economy. And even today, the food and drink sector supports 22,000 jobs in the region and accounts for around one-fifth of Scotland's food and drink activity. Within the last year, Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce conducted a survey in this sector and found that 37% of respondents uh, reported export activity compared to only 29% in 2011 with over a third of the revenue coming from countries outside the UK. Encouragingly, 78% of businesses expected to grow and expand, with over 17% expecting to retain um, their existing scale. However, 37% reporting uh, export activity does show that there's huge potential still for growth, and about 55% of businesses we're looking to invest for growth. But challenges exist in terms of recruiting senior managers, sales staff, and competition with other industries in the region who pay our higher wages is quite acute. And I would really like to pay tribute to the many people from other parts of Europe who have come to work in this sector in the Northeast vital workers in a tight labour market an example, and an example of why exit from the EU would be disastrous for Scotland. So more growth potential is there and that is why the upcoming inquiries by the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee on exports and my own committee, the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee on all forms of freight, freight transport will hopefully identify the opportunity and challenges for Scotland's businesses. Uh, most freight is carried on scheduled passenger flights and much is exported through direct routes from uh, uh, to the Middle East, Dubai and Doha. And it's important when new routes are developed for passengers that we also think of the export potential for our products in the holds of these aircraft. Yes, of course. Claudia Beamish. Sorry. Sorry, could I have your microphone up? Thank you. Would the member agree with me that um, also within Scotland it's very important that 
we look at freight being moved uh, increasingly from road onto rail in view of um, the, the arguments which you'll know as well as I do. What in what? Yes, of course, and that's, of course, what we, one of the aspects that we'll be looking at in our inquiry. <clears throat> but the, the North East is not just a food larder. It has a huge potential as a food destination. <clears throat> and the Chamber of Commerce has joined together with the region's three um, destination marketing organisations, Visit Aberdeen, Royal Deeside and Bamshire Coast, Aberdeenshire Council and the Regional Tourism Partnership and submitted a bid for funding to the Visit Scotland 2015 Food and Drink Growth Fund and I really hope they are successful and having had a meeting this morning with Philip Smith, the Regional Director of Visit Scotland for Aberdeen City and Shire, I sincerely hope this initiative is successful as there, much is there, there is really much that can be built on, not just on the annual Taste of Grampian uh, event, which I'm sure my colleague Christian Allard will speak about, but also the many agricultural shows and festivals which have an, uh, a potential to be um, showcases for the region's food and drink. And there's also still huge improvement that can be made in the hospitality sector and skills development in this area was a main subject of my conversation with Philip Smith this morning. Hospitality uh, and the career pro pro uh, potential and pro progression therein was previously uh, much sought after and really needs to be so again. I welcome the fact that becoming a, a good food nation, the document doesn't just concentrate entirely on food and drink production and food tourism, but also the wider importance of food. I welcome the recent announcement, for example, on improving the standards of food in our hospitals. And while there has been improvements in the food served up in schools, much still needs to be done in persuading our children. I see, unfortunately, the school group has left uh, and their parents on the desirability uh, for their long-term health of eating healthy, nutritious food. Uh, there are still opportunities for councils and health boards to really look at their procurement practices. Bulk buying from a farm may not always be the most cost-effective, and local uh, producers can be competitive and more responsive to their needs. I'm afraid you must try to close, please. Yeah, many um, presiding officers then, in conclusion, the need for families to have access to better food has been mentioned, and it's very welcome that the NFU briefing in this debate said that the achievement of a good food nation requires a growing and sustainable economy that promotes growth of disposable incomes from all our citizens so that they can buy this food. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Cara Hilton to be followed by Rob Gibson. Thank you, sir. Um, I welcome the opportunity to speak in today's debate on food and drink in support of the motion and in particular in support of Scottish Labour's amendment, which stresses the importance of an inclusive food policy, a food policy which puts accessibility, affordability and sustainability at its heart that acknowledges every step of the food supply chain impacts on our environment and that considers how we produce, grow and capture food and assesses the impact on wildlife, soil, oceans, air, resources and on our climate. In Dunfermline and across Fife, we've certainly got a lot to be proud of in terms of local food and drink production and the pr promotion of good quality local produce. Last year, I had the pleasure of attending the opening weekend of Abbott Brewhouse, which is located right in Dunfermline's historical centre. Beers are brewed on site to historic recipes, so you literally have the chance to enjoy a taste of history in, Dunfermline, in Scotland's ancient capital. I'm not normally a beer fan, but I can confirm I was impressed by what I sampled. And I would strongly encourage anyone visiting Dunfermline to take some time to sample the local beers from this 17th century style brew house. We've also got the privilege in Dunfermline of a monthly Fife Farmers Market on the second Saturday of every month at the Glen Gates, offering a wide range of fresh produce from Fife's finest producers. And last week, Dunfermline hosted the World Scotch Pie Championships, a competition which highlights the skill of bakers and butchers from across Scotland who create top quality pastry products. Angus MacDonald should maybe have come along to sample the, <laughs> the produce. Last week too, we saw the launch of Dunfermline's exciting Venture Street initiative, and I was pleased to discover that one of the units, Soup Amen, 
which is trading from Bruce Street, will be selling quality soup that is made from fresh local product products sourced from local farmers. And back to beer again, Dunfermline's annual beer festival is another huge success, with record attendance, allowing visitors the opportunity to sample more than 60 of the country's best ales and ciders. Just a few examples of how the local food and drink market is flourishing in Fife, albeit not all of them the most nutritionally sound examples. And there is no doubt that the food and drink sector across Scotland makes a huge contribution to our economy. All the briefings provided for the debate today have shown that in terms of both targets and turnover, the sector is exceeding all expectations, supporting 360,000 jobs across Scotland right now and hopefully even more in the future. I'm pleased too that the Scottish Government has made the decision to make 2015 the year of food and drink, to celebrate and promote Scotland's produce, because we've certainly got the best natural produce in the world and we've got a lot to offer. It is pleasing too to see that an explosion in the local food movement with 150 new local food initiatives and many more food education projects in our schools. Initiatives such as fruitful schools are a really welcome development, supporting schools in growing, maintaining and enjoying orchards. A great way not only of teaching children where food comes from, but encouraging healthy eating at the same time, with the aim of ensuring that every single child gets a chance to pick and eat fruit straight from a tree. However, it is not enough just to celebrate our excellent local and Scottish produce or take comfort in the sector's strength. And as the Cabinet Secretary has already acknowledged, everyone in Scotland needs to have access to high-quality, affordable and healthy food. Yet, despite all the positive developments, Scotland still has some of the highest levels of diet-related poor health in the world. A report in the news this morning estimated that obesity costs the UK £47 billion a year, with the global costs the same as smoking and possibly having greater impact on the world than climate change. Closer to home, a report by NHS Fife revealed that one in five primary one children in Dunfermline is overweight or obese. The same report found that one in three adults in West Fife is obese and two-thirds are overweight. So while we're all rightly proud of Scotland's food and drink, the reality is that for many Scots, the products that we're rightly proud of and that Mike McKenzie described so vividly are out of reach for many folk. Too many families rely on ready meals and takeaways, either because of lack of time, lack of money or lack of confidence in cooking. The, NUF, um, the National Farmers Union have pointed out in their briefing that the cost of living crisis means that many of Scotland's agricultural products are out of the reach of many Scots. And the fact is that austerity is still the reality for too many consumers who have got no choice but to focus on the cheapest deal and not the most eth ethical or sustainable one. With families and communities across Scotland struggling to make ends meet and to juggle the demands of work and family, too many of us continue to rely on diets that contain too much sugar, too much fat and are accompanied by too little exercise. Health professionals have warned that children are being condemned to a lifetime of ill health, a generation destroyed by junk food and lack of exercise. And it's a ticking time bomb, really, that we just can't ignore. So we need concerted action to ensure that every family in every community across Scotland has got access to high quality, affordable and healthy food. And we need more action from the UK and the Scottish Government, also at local level, to tackle food poverty, to end the scandal of children who are going to school hungry, of mums who are going without their tea so they can heat their homes. Um, and in that light, I read a report from Homestar um, recently uh, that one in four adults in Scotland has skipped meals in the last year so that someone else in their household could eat. The same survey said that 30,000 children in Scotland live in families who cannot afford to eat properly at all. We all know constituents who have had no choice but to turn in desperation to food banks, but yet, as Alec Rowley pointed out earlier, uh, while families are going hungry across Scotland, millions of tonnes of food has been wasted and thrown away every year. So while it's all very easy for us to blame the UK coalition government for its welfare reforms, there's still a lot that we can do here in Scotland to tackle poverty and make life better and healthier for families. And I, I will encourage the Cabinet Secretary and other members to have a look at Home Start's excellent manifesto for families in Scotland, which outright, outlines the number of actions the Scottish Government could take right now to make life better for our children and protect, protect them from hunger and poor nutrition. In concluding, the RSPB provided us with a very helpful um, guide for today's debate, and I would endorse their view in that guide that we need a food system that provides environmentally sustainable, healthy and affordable food for all, rather than as the expensive exception. We need a food system that is not just environmentally sustainable, but is socially just. And only then, when we meet this aspiration, could Scotland truly proclaim itself a good food nation. I know across the Chamber we all share this objective, and hopefully in the new spirit of cooperation and unity we can achieve this goal. Thank you.
I now call Rob Gibson to be followed by Christian Allard. Well, thank you, President Officer. Many of the themes that have been uh, led already are ones which, uh, as Alec Ferguson said, might well find themselves being repeated. But uh, I'd like to home in on this excellent uh, proposal for becoming a good food nation. The Scottish Government's aim is at a 2025 horizon. That's at roughly three parliaments away from now. I think that's something which shows vision, and I believe that it's necessary to think in those terms in order to create the kind of policy that will be long-lasting and effective. Because a land of food and drink is not only what we produce, but also what we buy, serve and eat ourselves. And that's why I believe that becoming a good food nation is the key document for these next 10 years to achieve those aims. In, when it was launched in June, it sought to be able to uh, add to the uh, recipe for success. However, this policy hinges not on exports and lucrative niche markets, but on a target for 2025 for people from every walk of life to take pride and pleasure in the food served day by day in Scotland. This comes as huge challenges in the financially challenging times that thousands of working poor families require food banks every month, as has been mentioned. It proposes in the policy nothing short of a food revolution. The ready availability of what constitutes good food requires all sections of Scottish life, from schools to food manufacturers via hospitals, retailers and restaurants, to commit to serving it. On that point, social justice and justice for uh, food in this country requires that the producers of food get paid a fair amount of money for what they produce, as well as being affordable to the people who go to buy it. And the problem we have with supermarkets that uh, uh, have always made sure that they uh, get their profits first, we've got to make sure that the grocery adjudicator that's been mentioned already is actually effective and that we finally see some of these supermarkets being hauled up. And we can see, as times get tough, that they are losing custom at the top end. And indeed, that the Lidl's and Aldi's of this world are making inroads, partly because they're serving things uh, in a, a, a fashion which people can afford. But it doesn't seem to me that they're having as bad an effect on the uh, producer. Or indeed, that they're always going for the apples that look the prettiest. The reason for the waste of food is because of the selection that supermarkets think people will wish to buy. Well, folk who go to farmers markets know that you get knobbly potatoes and carrots and things like that. We have to get away from what the look of the thing is and what the taste of it is and finding our way towards that. Children's well-being and reducing the uh, most intractable dietary related diseases need an increasing organic food uh, industry, I would argue, for it to thrive in Scotland to base itself on our culinary heritage of the past. I see the Scottish Government's role in tackling climate change as a key driver. Um, I see land reform and community empowerment as means to reintroduce the ability for more Scots to own and control the land that supports their lives. In so doing, the vision of Scandinavian levels of fairness and social justice that have been debated in the independence referendum particularly can energise this nation if we apply these ideas here. So respect for our soils, plants and animals, the balance of nature are driving the arguments about returning to one planet living. Food for the mind and the body are uh, the heart of a sustainable uh, country about sustainable lives which Scots can make a recipe for success. We should see some of the good examples that there are in schools. I'll be hosting uh, Food for Life again next February. The last time they were in from uh, East Ayrshire and South Ayrshire, showing us what they produce in school meals was an eye-opener for many people. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary was there and many others. They're coming back. Crofting Connections in the Highlands are doing a great job with thousands of youngsters from primary and now secondary schools learning how to grow things and then eat them. And for Liam MacArthur's benefit, he probably remembers the children from Sandy who grew the pigs from little piglets until they were big enough and then they were killed and they ate them. And they were cheering 
when they said that at our reception in uh, the, uh, the, the, the main hall. And I think that gives you a sense of where people are connected. It was a superb moment because everybody burst out laughing. And I think it underlines the fact that people were reconnected with the growing of food and indeed its, its eating. Just a little moment uh, at the end about exports. Be very careful, I think, about whisky. At the moment, we can see that there's a contraction in the markets for whisky. It's our largest food and drink export. We can see that in China, Singapore, the US, Brazil and Mexico, it's being reducing. Now, those of us who remember a while back in the 1980s when distilleries were being closed, we're not seeing anything like that. I'm not being a scaremonger. But some of the expansion projects by Diageo, these multinational pro uh, companies, are being put on hold. So the ever extension of exports, presiding officer for whisky, are not necessarily the best basis for the kind of policy we're talking about. So social justice is about making sure that our food policy fits what we need. It's, as I said at the SNP conference last week, it's not just the fare served in the excellent restaurants in Perth or Paris. It's what's served on every dinner plate from Durness to Dumfries so that every Scot every day can live healthier, fairer and greener lives. Many thanks. I now call on Christian Allard to be followed by Margaret MacDougall. Six minutes, please. President Officer, yesterday afternoon sitting in this chamber, I realised how much this nation has changed since I came to this country. This Parliament is resp responsible for a lot of those changes, and we heard this afternoon uh, almost this Cabinet Secretary is responsible for a lot of the good changes that happen in the food and drink sector. But going back to yesterday, the change of First Minister was really an historic day. We witnessed a modern leader taking charge of a modern Scotland. Scotland's new First Minister is a great communicator. She's always seen with a mobile phone in hand, and this First Minister might be able to help the Cabinet Secretary to promote the best of our local food. I saw yes yesterday that STV Aberdeen tweeted that our iconic Northeast delicacy, the Rawi, or buttery, if you don't know your loons from your coins, the Rawi is now available as a phone cover. The I Rawi is born, and is enough a fine phone cover. A few warnings come with the iRawi. Do not spread jam on this cover. Do not grill lightly. Do not eat. It will not taste good. <laughs> this modern nation of ours is indeed very innovative uh, when it comes to food and drink. And I started to rediscover its food tradition. And all involved in food production are adapting the fantastic food and drinks that you have uh, to modern Scotland. We are becoming a good food nation. President Officer, I spent most of my adult life in Scotland in the food industry, and where better than to taste the best food we have in offer, if not in the northeast of Scotland? You will find many Rowies as a taste of Grampian Food Festival held every year at the Thainstone Centre in Inverurie, and Maureen Watt was right, I was going to talk about the taste of Grampian, of course. At the Seafood Market, I helped Jimmy Buchan, the star of the BBC Trollerman documentary, uh, a great star, a great TV star, uh, cook as uh, Scottish langoustines this year. It was great to see Jimmy uh, sharing his extensive knowledge of seafood with many young families living in the northeast. Uh, the seafood market attracts huge crowds and is incredibly popular. Food champions like Jimmy, skipper of the Amity Two, and like Peter Bruce, skipper of the Budding Rose, promote seafoods in schools under the Seafood in Schools program of Seafood Scotland reaching tens of thousands of pupils every year. This is how we best promote the industry to future generations, presenting officer. Ask the fishermen, ask the farmers, the food processors, ask the experts, and this government is doing just that. Despite my best efforts this year, uh, the last few months, to promote free uh, uh, range Scottish chicken, we heard uh, that uh, the industry in Scotland is in trouble. Uh, we heard a few weeks ago that major retailers will not renew their contracts to buy free-range Scottish chicken. I thank any few Scotland for their briefing, and I agree, uh, food producers are unfairly disadvantaged due to top-down imbalances in profit distribution from large retailers to producers. This is about social justice, just like Rob Gibson stated earlier on. For, uh, it is social justice for rural Scotland. 
When the best of Scottish produce cannot reach our local supermarket shelves, we'll all suffer. I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to do anything in his power to help chicken farmers in the North East, like Bob Hay from Tariff. International demand for Scotland's food and drink is growing, and we have a lot to thank Richard Lockett for this, uh, travelling the world with our food producers and opening new markets for Scottish produce. This modern nation of ours is not only rediscovering its food tradition, but it's also passing it on to future generations. We are becoming a good food nation. We need to celebrate our food heritage and promote it as well. Our food and drinks, we need to promote our food and drinks innovations. The food and drink sector, presenting officer, is an integral part of our culture, or of, uh, and, uh, of our identity. This I learned very young. Uh, in Burgundy, the food and drink sector uh, is celebrated every year as a foie gastronomic in my hometown of Dijon. As the uh, cabinet secretary uh, said earlier on, uh, France is, of course, one of the, uh, uh, one of the most recognized good food nation. And in my hometown of Dijon, it's the biggest event in the year for the region, with more than 200,000 visitors. It is on a par with our own Royal Highland Show. My love with food will always be associated with the good family time spent at the food and drink fair. As a son of a farmer and as a seafood exporter for many years, I would love to see on show the best food and drinks from Scotland in my Burgundy in France. But it's a way, presenting officer, every year the show invites a country as a guest uh, to not only sell and display the best food and drinks, but also to promote the country as a tourist destination, showing off the best of its culture, of its identity. And next year is, of course, uh, Scotland a year for food and drinks. Uh, so what a great opportunity uh, for Visit Scotland, Cabinet Secretary. Let's show the world that we are becoming a good food nation. Uh, South Africa, Spain, China, Portugal, and many other countries came to Burgundy as the country guest over the years. And before anyone object, because of course we are not an independent nation, in 2001, Quebec was the guest of honor. Uh, I would like to finish on one uh, part of things about, yeah. about one uh, local uh, award winning uh, food producer, J.J. Ross, in Inverary. Uh, when he won in his, his award uh, earlier this year, he sent a message to all politicians. And he said, Politicians, if you want to know where the real engine rooms for the economy are and what will generate economic growth, look up your local family business. We are here, we employ, we invest. Presiding Officer. Thanks. I now call on Margaret McDougall to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and it is a great pleasure to speak in this debate today. As we have already heard, the food and drink industry is a huge part of Scotland's economy, generating £13.9 billion in 2012 and accounts for 13.2% of Scotland's total exports, while the sector directly employs almost 118,000 people. With 2015 being Scotland's year of food and drink, there has never been a better time to work to, to promote Scotland's quality and unique products across the world. The industry is still growing, and it's key that we nurture and support the industry to capitalise on the opportunities it presents. My speech today shall look at two aspects, the local benefit that food and drink industry brings to Ayrshire and Arran, and a few of the problems that face SMEs to grow their business in the sector. Ayrshire and Arran is an excellent example of the food and drink choices on offer in Scotland, from farmers markets to distilleries. It contributes around 16% of total visitor spending and in 2013, tourists spent more than £133 million in the local area. One example of good practice from the Ayrshire area is the collaboration between producers. For example, the North Ayrshire Food Network helps businesses to work together on issues such as distribution, marketing and export for their mutual benefit. Taste of Arran is a partnership that brings together 11 food and drink producers on the island, including specialist cheese, crunchy Arran oaties and delicious dairy ice creams, providing a single point of contact for sales, marketing and distribution for members. It can be prohibitively expensive for a small business to export on its own because of costs of pallets and containers. 
Taste of Arran work collaboratively with its members by sharing containers and other costs, which keeps costs down, enabling their goods to reach wider markets, which they would not otherwise have been able to tap into. When I spoke to Alistair Dobson from Taste of Arran at the Visit Scotland event last night, he said that he had been exporting for years from Arran to the mainland. And it made business sense to extend that principle to the rest of the UK and further afield. He also felt that this collaboration should be replicated across Scotland. In fact, there is a pilot running just now with around 20 SMEs and early figures are looking encouraging. I welcome the initiatives that the Cabinet Secretary mentioned today, but I'm sure many other small businesses could benefit from schemes like these. Though companies have said to me that they wouldn't know how to go about it or who to contact to start the, the process. It would be beneficial if the Scottish Government would look into this and see if the North Ayrshire and Taste of Arran examples could be replicated across Scotland. In doing so, we would enable many more small businesses to export their products and so help the Government reach its target of a 50% increase in exports by 2017. Another issue that came to my attention when the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee held workshops in Perth recently was that there is a lack of collaboration between government departments. This led to other, one company missing a massive opportunity to export their potatoes to Russia because the governmental process was too slow. We need to get better at supporting business by having more cohesiveness between the many government departments involved in ensuring our food and drinks industry is able to produce and transport their goods to a global market. While this is just one company, it does beg the question how many more missed opportunities have been due to lack of collaboration between government departments. In this respect, I welcome John Swinney's comments at the EET committee uh, during budget scrutiny last week that new initiatives will be launched to assist and support companies to export. I do hope the government plans to streamline the process and make it quicker and easier for businesses to compete with competitors globally. Finally, there is an issue of logistics in terms of exports not only in terms of global connectivity, but making sure that within Scotland, businesses can move their goods quickly and easily and all the modes of transport link up effectively. There is a noticeable problem the further north you go in Scotland. And I welcome Maureen Watt's uh, committee carrying out the inquiry they are into um, freight and logistics. When dealing with the perishable food stuff, it's crucial that it can be transported quickly and in bulk, and that the haulage and freight industry has the proper infrastructure to deal with capacity. According to the Freight Transport Association, poor rail links mean weight limits and speed limits that put them beyond economic use. And there are areas out with the central belt which are lacking in capacity. To conclude, presiding officer, collaboration and connectivity are key to expanding our food and drink sector. If we wish to be world players in this industry, we need to focus on investing in our infrastructure and helping smaller businesses expand into local and global markets. Finally, we need to work to make sure the processes are clear-cut, streamlined and joined up to stop any unnecessary delays to the trading process. Thank you. And thank you. Now, tighter for time, uh, Colin Stewart-Stevenson to be followed by Rhoda Grant, up to six minutes now, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And first, may I apologise to colleagues as I have an engagement in Glasgow that means I shall leave before the end of the, the, the debate. Um, can I congratulate Mike McKenzie in particular uh, for setting what may turn out to be a new uh, record in that book uh, compiled by a well-known Irish uh, stout manufacturer, uh, the, uh, the contribution to Parliament that achieves the greatest number of press releases. Uh, he's not alone in that particular endeavour, but I think he, he, he trumps everyone else. And to advise the Chamber that I'm uh, ready to fly colleagues uh, all over Scotland in pursuit of good food and drink, never a hardship to do that, and to tell them, as Napoleon asked for lucky generals, you'd be flying with a lucky pilot, 
I have come off a plane in an emergency on three occasions so far and on the 4th of November, uh, November 1975 experienced parachute failure. So I can experience all these things. You can be with me. You will be perfectly safe if you do so. But to the matter of food and drink, uh, the important matter that is before us today. A couple of interesting things that um, Scotland is innovating in the matter of food and drink. It's not just simply that we're picking up the things we find lying around and finding a way of exporting them. Uh, did you know we're now exporting garlic to France from Murray? We're exporting snails from Scotland to France. And we're beginning to make serious inroads into the olive oil industry with our extra virgin cold-pressed oilseed rape uh, oil, which was first produced, I think, for commercial purposes, um, very close uh, to Peterhead and is now produced in a couple of different places. And it's a much better oil for cooking than olive oil. It can be heated uh, to a higher temperature before it starts to break down, and it is at least equal in flavour content uh, to that long-standing uh, Mediterranean uh, uh, material. So we're doing some things that people are not necessarily uh, aware of. Now, a Bank of Scotland survey tells us that 58 per cent of Scottish producers are planning to expand overseas in the next five years, and that's pretty good news. Uh, almost two-thirds did say uh, they would welcome uh, assistance in marketing and in developing brand awareness. Now, this business of brand is quite important. I think if you go around the world, you'll find very big recognition for scotch, for, the, for a wonderful whisky. Uh, indeed, in India, as I've made reference in the chamber before, there's a huge trade in second-hand Johnny Walker bottles. Uh, which are not always refilled with Johnny Walker whisky before being resold, and that pattern is repeated uh, around the world. But brands are precious things that need to be managed uh, carefully. An industry expert said uh, that uh, a brand is the evidence of a claim or distinction you make to your customers. And he continues, he said, brands are promises. When they're kept, customers keep them, they stay loyal to you. But when they're broken, you lose these customers for a very long period indeed. So having international recognition for many of our products is important, but it's important we live up to these international brands and our food exports uh, depend on them. Now, the good examples in my constituency, as there are in others, uh, one is uh, Gumi's Choice, which is a family-run business in Port Soy. They export smoked salmon. Uh, one exporter of the year award in 2009, they smoked the salmon with the barrels from the whisky industry. And you can actually taste which whisky it is when you taste the smoked salmon. And I think that's an ideal combination of the best of Scotland. And I love having that on my plate. Uh, indeed, the sales manager, Henry Ang Angus, commenting on their success, said, we have the right skills and resources in place to succeed in a global marketplace, and we've worked hard to develop relationships. And I think that's uh, what we all have to do. And of course, salmon and fish generally are among the healthiest things that we could possibly uh, eat. The budding rose has been mentioned. Well, I was at a sea fish event uh, last night uh, that was held in Edinburgh, and the budding rose got mentioned three times. So well done, Peter Bruce. The Peter Bruce brand is doing well. And I really look forward to the day when actually our fish products have the skipper's photograph and signature on the, on the, on the packaging, because increasingly products are sold in packaging, creating that even stronger link between the person who's responsible for the first early part of the quality right through the supply chain uh, to the customer. We want to see people saying there is an extra value in buying, well, Peter Bruce or many of the other skippers from Lee MacArthur's constituency as well as mine. I'm generous in these matters. No, I, I'm time-wise, you're, you're, you're tough. That's all I can say. Um, now, there are a couple of uh, things we need to be aware of in health. Uh, and one of them is perhaps the issue of trans fats where I think some recent research is showing that it can damage the memory. Clearly, I have avoided um, in any of that trans fat thus far, um, or I can't remember having had it. It's one or the other. I'm not quite sure which. Now, the Do industry you know close, has expectations. Uh, the industry is going to create lots of new jobs over the next few years. 
Like uh, a couple of others in here, I come from the age of rationing immediately post-war. Thank goodness we're now in a position where the quality of our food enhances the stature and health of our uh, people and creates a powerful economic driver for our economy. Presiding officer. Thank you very much for that quintessential speech. I now call on Rhoda Grant to be followed by George Adam. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I very much welcome uh, this debate on the Year of Food and Drink 2015. Um, and I hope this year will highlight what is best about Scottish products. And we've got a lot to be proud of, as we've heard pretty much all afternoon. We've got high quality produce that's recognised worldwide. And we have producers that aspire to excellence, as well as to build on our traditional fare. And whisky, what's there not to like about whisky? Um, presiding officer, I was proud um, to pursue the EU a protected geographical indication for Stornoway black pudding. Um, when Brian Wilson discovered an Edinburgh butcher selling Stornoway style black pudding, something had to be done. And it was not only misrepresentation, but it was a pretty shoddy imitation, nothing like the real thing. Um, the campaign took off, and I would like to pay tribute to the butchers who drew up the successful application and for their hard work doing this. And then this means that the economic benefit of the high-quality product is kept for the good of the islands. They say that imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. However, when it damages you economically, it can be a huge disadvantage, more so if it damages your reputation and, and the reputation of your product. And the campaign attracted pretty much universal backing from the islands and beyond, as well as support from both the Scottish and UK governments. It took a number of years and a great deal of hard work to apply um, and have the application granted, but it was worthwhile and it's now protected. Uh, products that are unique and excellent need to be protected from poor imitations. Lessons can be learned from this, and we see now that uh, Dundee are following suit with their famous Dundee cake, and we've already had success with Orkney cheese and our broth smokies, and it's important that we recognise where we have excellence and protect it. We also have areas that revel in their pursuit of or uh, excellence, like Orkney, and I mentioned Orkney cheese, but Orkney Island Gold is also a well-known brand that covers lamb and beef, but also encapsulates how the Orcadians market their food and indeed their hospitality. They aspire together towards excellence. And this recognises that the impact that joint marketing can have, they're not competing against each other, but they're jointly competing against everybody else. Islands, while having many advantages, also have the natural disadvantage when it comes to communications. However, I would have to say I'm lucky that in my region, island groups are blazing a trail to show how they can jointly market uh, their excellent products to the benefit of the whole community. We need to learn for, from that for different products, including our wonderful shellfish that is still exported uh, to the continent when we should be using it at home. And many people come to Scotland hoping to experience it. So I think while we've done much, there's much to do. As a Highlands and Islands MSP, I can't really speak on a debate about food and drink without mentioning whisky. Um, our region is home to the best whiskies in Scotland, and whether uh, your taste is the peaty malts from the west on the Argyle Islands, or indeed the mild honey of Astras Bay, there's something in the region for everyone. They provide jobs throughout the Highlands and Islands, and those are well-paid jobs when they're rare in this area. The export market provides income to the country and the excise duty helps to provide our schools and hospitals. And indeed, I think that's an all-round um, success. And in recent years, um, the Scots, Scotch whisky has been much in demand, leading to even more jobs created in distilleries when they're working around the clock to try and meet the demand. And maybe that ex uh, uh, expansion has peaked, but I would have to say that the jobs that it created were very welcome in some of the, the worst off areas in our country. We now have things like microbreweries growing um, all over the Highlands and Islands to great success. And indeed, um, following blazing a trail behind whisky is gin. Who would have thought that the Highlands would become famous for, for, for gin? But that's happening. We have, in fact, even Brewer are looking at marketing their own gin. So not only whisky, but gin as well. We have a lot to celebrate in 2015, our year of food and drink. Um, and it will provide huge uh, marketing opportunities globally. 
Uh, but as others have said in this debate, it would give us a real cause for celebration if next year that all Scots would have access to good quality food. It's sad that while those of us who can afford are celebrating this success, but many of our constituency, constituents are living out of food banks, even, and even access to them is being rationed. It would be a real celebration next year if we could eradicate food banks from Scotland. And to do that, we need to tackle the cause. We need to drive up skills and pay, especially in our food and drinks industry, and, but also in our hospitality industry too. Often those using food banks are working, and, but earning low wages. And it's important that we recognise that a fair day's work deserves a fair day's pay. We should aspire that every worker is earning the living wage. We are some way towards that in the public sector, but we have to find ways of increasing wages in the private sector and more so in our food industry. If we're to aspire to excellence we, need excellence, we need a motivated workforce who can afford to remain in the industry and build their skills and expertise. The Year Could of Food and Drink please? gives us opportunities and challenges. To reach excellence, we, don't, we not only need good produce, juice, but to market, and we need to ensure that we have access to a good diet. I believe that these challenges are something we can meet if we work together. Many thanks. I now call on George Adam to be followed by Jean Urquhart. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I am keen in um, being involved in this debate, not just as a consumer of food and drink, uh, but also because the industry is actually worth £2.5 million pounds per day to the Scottish economy. And that in itself has an impact in every one of our constituencies and every area we live because of the sheer volume of the size of the industry. You know, the international demand for our products, Scots Food and Drink, continues to grow. And Scotland's new food and drink export plan to capitalise on this and, uh, by uh, exporting food and drink by £5.4 billion pounds a year. Scotland is a global brand and it's very successful at that, but we can always do more and we can always ensure that the Scottish Government pushes our products uh, forward. Because it is, after all, worth about an estimated 117,900 jobs to uh, Scotland, and that in itself is quite a lot. And one of the other things that's mentioned as well is that food and drink exports is, in itself is a major part of the Scots economy compared to the UK. For example, in 2013, it uh, accounted for 30 per cent of our total exports, as opposed to UK exports of only six. So it's five times more important to us here in Scotland than it is to the rest of the UK. But one of the things that this debate has also brought up is it's important that we actually welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to tackle our serious public health issue that we have as well. Alex Rowley mentioned some of the good work that's happening in Fife. And when I was a councillor on Renfrewshire Council, we also had a lot of good uh, schemes as well. One in particular was, from a licensing point of view, we ensured that mobile vans weren't near schools. And it was quite difficult from a legal perspective, but it was a policy we managed to get through and made sure it wasn't easy for kids to be able to go out into school. And just We've all seen the scenes just outside a, at lunchtime in a school where the chip fans full of uh, school students there just trying to get some. So that helped in some way as well. But our grandparents knew more. They were more food aware than what we are because they knew uh, how to buy healthily and what to do. And I think one of the programmes we also did then was to ensure that families, it wasn't so much about it was uh, what they ate, but it was actually budgeting and making sure that they could all sit down as a family. And there was a programme in Renfrewshire where they did that with uh, some families, and they actually went on record by saying this made a big difference to them, because something as simple as sitting down to a meal talking to one another as a family, having a meal that was made for, uh, for them and actually doing it in a way that was cost-effective and good for them. That was uh, one of the programmes, and that's something we have to look at as well. And I think I've mentioned before, President Officer, that Murn FC and Engage Renfrewshire also had a programme where they taught fathers uh, to go to corporate hospitality in uh, St Martin and actually learn to use the facilities to cook. Now, there's more likely that fathers are going to go to a place like St Martin than they would be to a community hall to learn to cook as well. So it's about how we do these things. And then it ended up with uh, the fathers with their kids, uh, children actually having the meal as well. So 
Education is a major part of this as well for people in Scotland to ensure that we uh, look at it differently than what we actually eat as well. And every one of us has to look at it. You know, we are the, probably the world's worst here when you look at some of the things that are in the canteen and some of our own diets we possibly could look at ourselves. I, for one, have been watching recently what I eat as well. People say you're losing weight. It's thank you if you actually think that. But it's, uh, it's an ongoing struggle for myself to make sure that I keep that discipline as well. So I think it's important now as we go to a good food nation, we make sure that we do have uh, this kind of uh, uh, education and ensure that we engage with people in such a way that it can make a difference in their lives. And it's not just condescending, it's actually something that is of value for them as well. And, presiding officer, I'm, I'm looking at you now and I can see in your eyes, and I can see from here, that, that you're actually thinking, why have I not mentioned the great town of Paisley at this stage? And uh, there is more in the food and drink uh, than the Sherwood chip shop in the East End Tandoori in the town of Paisley, because we do have a company called Pirelli's Ice Cream, which is an Italian Scots family who came over in 1925. And unusually for Paisley, they actually come from San Biagio as opposed to Barga, because nearly every Italian Scots family comes from the most Scottish town in Italy, which is Barga itself, which incidentally, Mr Nettini, who owns a Castle Vici chip shop in Paisley. You know, his son's rather famous as a, an entertainer. You know, they, they're also, but they've made such a big difference. It's obviously, it's ice cream we're talking about in this scenario. And they do all types of ice creams from uh, budget ice cream right through to uh, the, the more kind of expensive ones. But the, the difficulty they have, and it has been mentioned here, is they've invested invested in a state-of-the-art facility. And the problems that they have is dealing with the big, the big shops to try and get into that market as a small business. And that is something and a challenge that is ongoing for companies like that. But we also have the bottling plant from Chivas Brothers in uh, Paisley as well. And they export across the world. And they recently invested in 2012 in a new bottling plant to ensure that they could actually... Uh, in increase the numbers of their specialised brands and their larger brands as well, which is all about going to the international markets as well. So when you look at some of the things that we've done there, we also have the largest beer festival in Scotland, which is uh, the Real Ale Festival in Paisley Town Hall, where there's a whole Scottish hall and there's a foreign beers hall as well. And uh, that's always popular. People come from all over to see Scottish products that are available there. Real Ale, one of them is from Orkney the Isles of Orkney, and uh, it's quite popular, the one called Skull Splitter in partic particular. Uh, but uh, everyone's only allowed a half pint of that. But we have many challenges, uh, presiding officer, but I think it's what we do, and we've got good stories to actually tell in food and drink that's going to be difficult. There's things for us to do, but I look forward to the 2015 year of food and drink, not just because I like both, but because it uh, gives us an close. opportunity to see what we can actually deliver. Many thanks. Um, now call on Jean Urquhart to be followed by Nigel Dawn. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you to the Cabinet Secretary too for bringing this debate. Um, I'd like to pay tribute to everyone who works in the food production uh, industries and fishermen and farmers and crofters, and that we acknowledge some of the difficulties that they face in bringing some of the products that have been highlighted uh, today as being uh, superb of their kind. Um, and also the difficulties just in, in feeding the nation and, and having an ambition that Scotland might be able to feed herself would be a fantastic target to, to uh, reach. There are a number of uh, areas, I think, that reflect and, and create issues uh, around our food and drunk drink industries, land reform, uh, communications, transport, legislation, tourism, and so on. Um, land reform, in as much as particularly in the area that I cover of Highlands and Islands, as I uh, travel across that whole area, there are undoubtedly land uh, mass and land masses where the owners are absent, and they then they are a barrier to people who would like to work that very land. Um, communications. I think uh, is becoming really important. As we know, there's a massive investment being made by uh, both governments and uh, British Telecom carrying out work at the moment. But just to get a real feel for how important that is, particularly for some of the smaller uh, producers, there's a, a small chocolate company in Durness um, 
uh, Cocoa Mountain, they're called, and I think without good broadband, which they don't have, they struggle. But they do export to over 30 countries around the world. And that, uh, you know, they've done that pretty much single-handedly. They have a superb product, and we need to recognise some of the difficulties that they have of distribution and exporting. And transport's the same. I mean, if, if we perhaps hadn't had the, the, the real Klondike, macro Klondike in the 70s and 80s on the West Coast, uh, when would our roads ever have moved from single track uh, all the way from the East Coast right up the Northwest Coast to, to Durness? So I, I think these are issues. Education, I've got a lovely story from a primary school of the um, primary school teacher who, whose young eight-year-old pupil arrived late in the class with the excuse that he had to teach his granny uh, how to use her iPhone and the teacher did have a light bulb moment and set up a class, indeed, where many grannies um, came in to learn how to use their uh, new technology from eight- and nine-year-olds. But the payback, which I think is one that might interest you, Minister, is that, uh, Cabinet Secretary, is that um, they in turn showed the children how to kipper a herring, make a ham, uh, hog, and uh, other traditional delights. So... The cookery class run by the over 70s um, is uh, still continuing, I may say, in, in teaching our children how to uh, perhaps renew skills that they otherwise wouldn't have. And finally, I think there's a couple of issues that I think are, are kind of threats to our industry. Um, as Environment Secretary Owen Patterson called on the EU to relax its stance on GM crops. And we're proud in this country, I think, that we do try and produce uh, quite a lot of organic food now and, and certainly have a good reputation for a, for a clean environment and uh, generally fresh, good uh, produce. A new Environment Secretary, Elizabeth Truss, has not made her view clear, but... In February this year, the EU licensed the GM maize variety Pioneer 1507 and the first new GM crop license in 15 years. 19 states opposed the license but were overruled by larger countries with more voting power um, led by the United Kingdom and Spain. So we're not hopeful. Um, the Scottish government is opposed to GM crops, um, stating that the cultiva cultivation of GM crops could damage Scotland's rich environment. And I would... I would certainly endorse that, and I think that we have to uh, take as firm a stance as we can. I mean, there's presently no commercial cultivation GM crops in Scotland, certainly. I'm very grateful to Jean Cook for taking the intervention. She'll be aware that the former scientific advisor at the Scottish Government and um, up until recently uh, scientific advisor to the uh, European Commission, uh, Professor Anne Glover, uh, has uh, had her services dispensed with in large part because of the position she took on GM. Does she support that decision or does she regret it? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last, just the last phrase, the question you asked me. Uh, sorry, does she, does she regret the decision to dispense with the, uh, the, the science, Chief Scientific Advisor to the European Commission largely on the basis of the stance she took in relation to GM? Remaining 40 seconds or thereby. Sorry, well, I, I do think that the evidence is, is large uh, against the case of GM, and I think we're right uh, for the moment to continue that stance in this country. Um, the other issue that I will uh, find just finally in the, my last few minutes raise is, is one of, that's raised by the NFUS and the supply chain where farmers and growers are often unfairly disadvantaged due to top-down imbalances in profit distribution from large retailers to producers. And I, I think that one of the front pages of the Shetland Times that will stay with me was the local uh, uh, dairy cooperative pouring milk down the drain um, when the uh, sales of imported and much cheaper milk. Now, I think there is a real difficulty. I'm not saying this is easy. We can't just uh, dictate uh, products in supermarkets. But I do think that there has to be a balance struck. And I think these are some of the, the issues that face our food and drink industry. But mostly, and finally, just to say on the tourism front, to draw to there's no doubt that um, our... our 
produce is highly prized and uh, loved by people who come here. I, I would like to praise Flybe for always offering you either stoats, tunnocks, or uh, walkers produce, um, and criticise ScotRail for offering neither or none of these. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I'll um, now call on Nigel Dawn. Uh, six minutes, please, as, and after Thank which we'll move to closing speeches. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. This has been a long afternoon, but I am going to uh, join the list of colleagues who have taken us around our constituencies, and I hope that we will find that we not only have a little lesson in geography, but I might actually go somewhere interesting as well. If I were to take a, a tour around Angus North and Mearns, I, I could start actually with oatmeal of Afford, which sounds strange because Afford is not in my constituency, but apparently that business, which produces organic uh, materials and, and cereals and, and foods, uh, took its name from the fact that Afford is the nearest, or was, the nearest railway station. Uh, there is no one in Lawrence Kirk. Strange things that we find. I uh, pop into Brekin and, and uh, Ella drinks, the Bouverage raspberry, blaberry and strawberry drinks, uh, and reiterate the point that the Cabinet Secretary has earlier made, of course, that we produce berries. We produce lots of berries, and they're actually very good for us, and if we don't want to eat them as berries, we can drink them as juice. Um, my colleague, Graham Day, is the MSP for Angus South, and he's not able to be with us this afternoon. And I know that he would have picked up on Angus growers, who again produce soft fruits across the whole area, including Angus, Perthshire, and Fife. Um, Mackey, uh, who produce jams and marmalades in Arbroath from those very fruits, of course. And I'm sure that Graham would also have wanted to point out the Arbroath Smoky, uh, and in particular R.R. R. Spinks and Sons, established in 1715, uh, who produce Arbroath Smokies. Now, if I came back into my own constituency and back into Brickin, I would get to the Glen Cadham Distillery. We have many of those, of course. I don't think anybody's yet mentioned, of course, that a distillery is where it is because of its water, which is the bit that you tend not to transport, although in this particular case, they do have nine miles of pipe bringing it from the springs of the Morans. But water is also exported from Forfa. The Strathmore Water Bottling Plant in Forfa makes use of the fact that the spring is quite literally at the bottom of what once, once upon a time have been the garden. Um, and it's fascinating that this pipe just appears out of there, and that, of course, is, is where they bottle it. Now, those local businesses employ people, produce products which we enjoy and which we export. When I speak to those businesses, one of the things that they do pick up is, in fact, one of the things that the Labour Party picked up in, in their amendments, and that is the need for skills because the food industry uses a very wide range of skills, which are not necessarily ones which have been taught at home um, and not necessarily taught in skill, school. And actually, I, as a chemical engineer, am probably the best have the best qualification for working in the food industry because process development and chemistry on a decent scale is actually exactly what that's about and exactly what I was taught to do. I also note when it comes to skills, and other colleagues have mentioned this, George Adam and, and Jean Urquhart in particular, of course, that we don't, by and large, as a generation, know how to cook. It was our parents who were probably the last cookers. Our children frequently have no idea how to, to, to cook. And that is one of the issues which we do have to address if we're going to deal with obesity and fresh food, uh, because we now really have a dependency on processed food. Before coming to obesity as, a, as an issue, which is what I'd like to major on, I would like to pick up on an issue which nobody else has picked up on yet, which is that of pollinators. Um, we have received a briefing from Bug Life pointing out that uh, bees and their like are an extraordinarily important part of our food system. And I do want to suggest to the Cabinet Secretary that he might just want to consider whether counting bees is actually one of those national indicators that we should consider, formally or otherwise. We count birds as a surrogate for biodiversity. We count fish as a measure of uh, sea health. And I wonder whether actually pollinators are, because they're relatively big and relatively countable, uh, is actually something that we should consider counting on a national basis, and, or at least estimating, of course, we're not going to count every one, as a national indicator of agricultural health. But uh, lastly, I'd like to come to the issue of obesity. Others have mentioned it. Um, I took the advice of one of our national experts on the Scottish diet uh, 
members will know I do that fairly frequently. The difficulty we have is that the diet really hasn't changed much. Despite our best efforts, it's still far too easy for us to be overweight and obese. It's far too easy for us to eat too many calories and incidentally too much salt. And whilst perhaps the figures might have stabilized, they're certainly not getting better. Now, the Scottish Government is clearly trying, is clearly ambitious, and I do want to commend the Cabinet Secretary for raising the issue not only in the report, but actually in some detail this afternoon, because I think it's very easy to talk about our exports and our products, and actually to ignore the issue, which is central to the health of the nation. References previously may made to the fact that it's now probably as important as smoking in the cost to our nation. Uh, I therefore commend him for taking it seriously. I commend him for producing a standard for responsible marketing for food and drink. The industry will not like what we're trying to tell them, but they will have to get on board. This is a problem we do have to sort. It might need taxation. It clearly does need work on portion sizes, which is already going on. It does need work on formulation, which is already going on. It does need work on education, which is already going on. They will all play their part. But this is going to be an extraordinarily difficult one to crack. It needs everybody to get involved, including the industry. Um, and the profit motive is clearly not on our side. We need to find ways of persuading our food businesses um, to go the extra mile, to look after the health of the nation and on occasion to forego that profit. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Are we now move to winding up speeches, and I call on Jamie McGregor. Six minutes, please, Mr McGregor. Um, I always welcome the opportunity to promote Scotland's world-class food and drink. Um, not least the vast majority of whisky production, Scotland's leading food and drink export, which is so valuable to our balance of payments, the branding of Scotland internationally and our economy. The whisky industry is to be congratulated for growing the value of exports by 90% over the last decade. Its planned capital spend of two billion over the next three to four years, and the fact that around 30 distillery projects are being brought forward by new entrants, in addition to the 109 existing distilleries, demonstrates the potential for significant further growth in the years ahead. I'm delighted that work has begun on a new distillery on Harris. And I commend the efforts of Burr Bakewell, the founder and chairman of Isle of Harris Distillers Limited. And I'd also recommend the Kilhoman Distillery on Isla, which I visited last year, and the artisanal Red River Distillery on Lewis. Now, we have, without doubt, the finest hard-shelled prawns, lobsters, scallops, and other sorts of shellfish of anywhere in the world. Um, and, of course, Orkney has been marvellous about marketing its crab meat. Um, we also have wonderful game and venison, which is high protein, low colostral, and delicious. Also wonderful fruit and vegetables. And we now have a rapidly growing number of restaurants all over Scotland, which make use of these indigenous ingredients and earn a great reputation for themselves and Scotland in doing so. Let's not forget our excellent sm Scottish smokehouses like Inveraw and Loch Fine in Argyll, at the Stornoway Smokehouse and Hebridean Smokery in the Western Isles, and the high quality of our farm Scottish salmon, which supplies these places. Now, we've had a very good and constructive debate today, which has allowed members to highlight the many successes, but there are challenges too. These include the impacts of climate change, changes to agricultural support payments, skill shortages, and the impact of trade sanctions internationally something we've witnessed recently in terms of the Russian ban on imports, which has hit our pelagic fishermen in particular, who have lost important Russian export, export ma markets for mackerel. I was in contact with the Scottish Pelagic Processors Association before today, and I was pleased they informed me that after the Russian ban, targets and strategies were identified, and some progress has been made in finding new markets and expanding sales to existing markets. Russia took a larger grade of mackerel, and it's been challenging to find another outlet for that size. Ukraine takes the same size, but problems existed obtaining credit insurance cover in the present circumstances in Ukraine. And I'm pleased that insurance cover is being made available through the UK government's UK Export Finance Organization, and shipments have since been made to Ukraine using this facility, which is, again, another tangible benefit for our food export sector of being part of the UK. Um, Seafish have helped with trade exhibitions, and SDI's global network has given new sales leads in the Far East, and their personnel in Tokyo did a great job recently. 
by getting promotion, a promotion of Scottish mackerel in a major Japanese retail chain, Aon. While the industry is making progress, they face major competition from Norway, whose pelagic industry has, spent, has a spend of seven million per year for promoting their pelagic products. Scottish suppliers have been displaced in Russia by Iceland and the Faroes, as they are not affected by the sanctions, and it may be hard to get that market back. Uh, I agree with members who have argued that providing local food and delicacies to home consumers and tourists in Scotland is extremely important and potentially lucrative for local businesses, as research indicates visitors, visitors spend about a fifth of their holiday budget on food and are willing to pay up to 15% more for, for, for food of Scottish or regional origin. Examples of delicacies in Argyle that have not already been mentioned can be found at the seafood cabin in Skipness, the Oban Seafood Hut, and I want to commend the work of cooperatives which are working to support local food producers in my region, such as Food from Argyle, which promotes Argyle and Butte's fantastic game, drink, meat and seafood, and organises farmers' markets and local food stands at major events, such as musical, music festivals, all over Scotland. I can highly recommend the truly delicious Real Mackay Stovies Company, home-roasted lamb stovies, made from the farmer's own black-faced sheep, reared on his own hill farm in Argyle. And I would commend the Scottish Crofting Federation for helping to launch earlier this year the Scottish website, Crofting Enterprise, uh, which showcases some of the tremendous crofting produce, such as the heather-fed Hebridean mutton and na native Shetland lamb. Nothing is more succulent. And I hope many more crofters can become involved in this welcome initiative as time goes on. As species champion for the marsh fertility butterfly, the charity Bug Life Scotland asked me to highlight that our fruit industry in Scotland retires entirely, entirely on pollination by insects. It said that out of every three mouthfuls of food we eat, one is pollinated by insects. The value of this free service is estimated at 12.6 billion a year. Um, now, presiding officer, how am I doing for time? You're virtually out of it. Oh, right. So to conclude, um, we welcome the opportunity of debating food and drink policy in this chamber. The transatlantic trade and investment partnership uh, can further increase the successes of Scottish food and drink. A good TTIP deal could bring an additional 1.7 billion to the Scottish economy, and a large proportion would be thanks to include, with thanks to increased food and drink exports. And we might hopefully see a lifting of the current U.S. import ban on Scotch beef, all thanks to a good TTIP agreement. We look forward to the Scottish Government to put in place policies that are pro-business and support our primary producers like farmers, fishermen and crofters. Thank you. Thank you much a vintage speech. I now call on Claudia Beamish. Eight minutes will there by. Please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am very glad that the Cabinet Secretary has called this debate today, as many members have pointed out, as we move towards the year of food and drink in 2015. Members from all sides of the chamber have highlighted the huge importance of food and drink and this whole sector in Scotland, having as we have some of the highest quality products from shellfish to scotch whisky, which are exported all over the world. From Springbank to Valhalla, Mike McKenzie's tour is certainly enticing, and there has been a, a wee bit of competition between the different constituencies, not least Paisley, of course, uh, uh, as to where the, where the best tours might be. But I would simply suggest that members ask um, Visit Scotland to put all the tours in all the constituencies onto their website, because I'm sure that tourists and people within Scotland would much enjoy that. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome the becoming of a good food nation. As the Cabinet Secretary said in his ministerial forward of the document, it is vital, and I believe this is key, that we address the paradox of having such high-quality food products, but at the same time also having a generally unhealthy relationship with food in Scotland. We must acknowledge and tackle food poverty, and fuel poverty indeed, as this is a challenging issue for many families. As Rhoda Grant said, food banks must be a thing of the past, and we must make this happen in 2015, and this is the responsibility of us all across the chamber and far beyond. This is, as the Cabinet Secretary says, unfinished business. In the Good Food Nation, the Cabinet Secretary stressed the need, and I quote, for a, a commitment from all to change. 
and stressing public food, local food, and of course, children's food. Liam MacArthur highlighted the contribution of the previous Scottish executive to the agriculture strategy. It is of course important to focus on how we produce food in the first place. Our farmers do do us a great service by growing crops and raising animals on a commercial scale. And the new cap arrangements must allow them to, to continue to do this, but in an increasingly sustainable way. Many farmers have taken on the climate challenge. In the next period leading up to the cap review in 2017, it is essential that all farmers work to reduce their emissions. With 20% of greenhouse gas emissions coming from agriculture, the use of public money through cap payments means there is an expectation that the public good is equally important as production itself. This can be voluntary with the right government support. However, it is my view that it will need to become mandatory if results aren't seen rapidly. There are some models which I would like to highlight of smaller scale production, which other members have discussed today as well, which can yield positive results in many ways. Community growing projects can have a significant benefit for communities, not just in terms of the food produced, but also by creating enjoyable spaces for local people to congregate and improving biodiversity. Indeed, biodiversity can be greatly improved by organic fruit and vegetable growing without potentially harmful pesticides, such as neonicotinoids, meaning bees and other pollinators are able to thrive, as mentioned uh, by Jamie McGregor and also Nigel Don. I'm pleased to say that organic production has been supported by the Scottish Government in the latest SRDP. Particularly, I would like to point out, as Scotland is at the moment bottom of the European label or, uh, uh, table for uh, organic consumption and near the bottom with production as well. And with the organic market flourishing in countries such as France, which has doubled in the last five years, I'm sure members will agree there is some catching up to do. One organisation in my own region of South Scotland, Whitmere Organics, has led the way with their commitment to organic produce and the Cabinet Secretary was at the launch of their community shared farm offer. Whitmere has been able to develop living learning space as a resource to encourage school children, farmers and the general public in learning about sustainable food and farming. Peebles Can is another group in South Scotland. They are a not-for-profit community-based organisation with the aim of promoting local and seasonal food and reducing food waste, an important issue which has been highlighted by the RSPB briefing for this debate. They say post-plate wastage in the UK amounts to almost a quarter of the total food bought. As Alex Rowley highlights, the Community Empowerment Bill will help with this allotment access and other community projects. And it will also aid communities in purchasing land to grow. And the petition before the Scottish Parliament, the right to grow, makes a contribution to this way forward as well. As well as the production of food itself, the means by which it is distributed is equally important as has been stressed by a number of members. And fresh, affordable and local food, as highlighted in our amendment today, is absolutely essential. NFUS, in their briefing, have recognised the importance of short supply chains, especially, and I quote, to ensure more transparency and a fairer distribution of margin throughout. Short supply chains which, chains which connect producers more closely with consumers bring many benefits and they strengthen rural communities because producers retain more of the retail price and create more jobs per meal. They involve less processed and often healthier products and can drive up the environmental and animal welfare standards because customers know more about how their food is produced. Margaret McDougall has stressed the importance of shared container arrangements from the islands through collaboration with the Taste of Arran. And members may be aware that Nourish Scotland, who have been instrumental in pr promoting short supply chains, have also argued for their use as a means of reducing food poverty by connecting low-income urban communities directly with primary producers. How to cook freshly has been highlighted by many members. And it is a challenge in our busy lives. However, from growing and preparing and cooking, these can be therapeutic processes and help our well-being, whether it be herbs from a window box or tatties from the allotment. When I taught at Abington School, we formed a parents and kids group for cooking. And this is one of the ways forward, which I know is replicated in many constituencies and should be supported, I believe, by Scottish Government. 
The Soil Association's Food for, for Life Scotland is another initiative, which I know that Rob Gibson has highlighted, and there will be further reports on how many councils are now gaining the Food for Life gold standard for school meals uh, when he has his event in the future. In relation to vertical integ uh, integrated supply chains, I want to highlight cooperatives as an important way forward. Scottish shellfish farmers in the northern coasts bring their products to a factory in Bells Hill, and it is an effective co-op with control of operations by members making decisions. I would also raise uh, the issue if the Cabinet Secretary could, in his closing remarks, say something about what Alex Ferguson also raised about the aquaculture industry and targets and whether that still fits with sustainable development. We'd seek reassurance on that. Protected status is essential, as the Stornoway Black Pudding men mentioned by Ro Rhoda Grant highlights. And as Stuart Stevenson says, brands are promises. From whiskey to microbrews, micro from salmon to steak, we have a great, a fine food story to tell. But let's recall the words of Cara Hilton in closing. We need a food system that is not only environmentally sustainable, but is also socially just. Only when we can meet this aspiration can Scotland truly proclaim itself to be a good food nation. And I believe that 2015 is the time for that to become true. Thank you. Excellent. Many thanks. And we now move to the final speech from the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary, you have until five o'clock, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and thank you to all members for their contribution to a debate on what could not be a more important issue for Scotland's future and the well-being of our people. I think the fact that so many members mentioned the food culture, their local constituencies, as well as wider society and the very successful food and drink businesses in their own constituency highlights that we all do recognise the food and drink industry is massively important to Scotland's economy. And I particularly welcome Mike McKenzie's food and drink tour of the Highlands, uh, which was nearly as good as what you would get if you visited Murray. Uh, and of course, as the MSP for 50% of Scotch whisky and Walkers and Baxters and McLean's Bakery and many other businesses, I do pay close attention to the, the value to our local economies of the food and drink industry in Scotland, as again illustrated by many members around the chamber. And in terms of whisky, <clears throat> we talk about distilleries, and that's not just a Highlands and Islands and Islands issue or Speyside issue. It is, of course, about the bottling plants. And I was struck by how George Adamman from uh, his constituency in Paisley uh, and also Angus MacDonald and Falkirk were referring to the massive employment in terms of the bottling plants. So these industries spread the economic benefits right throughout the whole of Scotland. But one thing I think most contributions had in common was the fact that Scotland is experiencing a food and drink revolution. And we can all see the evidence of that on their own doorsteps and with the national statistics. And let's remind ourselves of what has been achieved in a few short years, which gives us optimism and hope for what can be achieved with the next few years as well. Since 2007, turnover has increased to now £13.9 billion in food and drink in Scotland, achieving the targets for growth six years early, a 51% increase in food and drink exports since 2007, a 32% increase in the sales of Scottish brands across retailers throughout these islands, and also a 50% increase in farmers' markets and 150 new local food initiatives in the last 10 years alone. Alex Riley. Um, Jimmy McGregor mentioned the transatlantic trade and investment partnership and the benefits that he sees coming from that. I just wonder, when we talk about future investment and, and other markets, what's the Minister's view on that? The Secretary. Uh, thank you. I'm actually just about to address that point just shortly, so if you don't mind, I will, I will come back to your point. That's a good point. But in terms of the, what, the achievements since 2007, I've listed some of the key ones. Uh, what's really exciting is the likes of the Bank of Scotland report, which many members quoted, which looks to the future. The fact that 66% of businesses expect to increase their workforce in the years ahead. Three quarters expect 
that to go up by 15 per cent in terms of their, their sales and exports, and 58 per cent want to engage more with international customers. And of course, there's the thousands and thousands of new job opportunities that are likely to be in the pipeline highlighted uh, in the report as well. And what that shows is that looking at the success of the last few years, we know we're still only scratching the surface. There is massive opportunity left to tap into, not just in terms of international demand, but demand here on their own doorstep uh, as well. And some members did mention the barriers to exports and the fact that small businesses in particular uh, face the daunting task of leaving the domestic market and going into the export markets. However, many companies have done that and done that successfully. You just have to look at Innocent Gun, for instance, which is a, a craft beer company, which we're all familiar with. It's not far from Parliament. And that is a company only been going for a few years and has seen a 9,000% increase in sales to North America in the last four years alone. It's now the second biggest beer in Canada. So this is a company that didn't exist a few years ago and look at its achievements. And that's a familiar story from many of the companies we speak to. We are holding events in Scotland with the small businesses and medium-sized businesses trying to encourage them to get into the export markets and let them meet international buyers. We invite here to Scotland and the, the Showcasing Scotland event, which was just held in July, for instance, uh, set up 600 meetings in this country be between local companies here in Scotland and international buyers. And of course, we've taken small businesses on learning journeys overseas to some of the big food and drink exhibitions as well. So that is proving to be productive. And we've got the likes of Paul Grant, who built up the very successful exports track record for Mackay's Jams. And he's now he's working with the dairy industry in Scotland to show how we can add value to milk and to the dairy products so they can take advantage of the massive export opportunities. But I do agree with many members, this is very much down to a partnership approach to success. I do want to join Alec Ferguson and others in paying tribute to Scotland Food and Drink, particularly James Withers. Uh, what a fantastic ambassador he is for Food and Drink in Scotland. As their chief executive, he's achieved so much, and I commend all his efforts and pay tribute to the outgoing chair, Ray Jones, as others did as well. I also pay tribute to SDI, Scotland Development International. When you go overseas and you speak to international companies as well as Scottish companies operating overseas, they're absolutely full of praise for Scottish, uh, De Scotland, Scottish Development International and all the fantastic work uh, that's taking place to get us into new markets overseas as well as Scottish enterprise uh, here in Scotland. So I pay tribute to the various sectors and trade associations that are involved in that as well. Ultimately, of course, it's down to people. It's down to our farmers, our fishermen, our crofters who produce the raw materials that underpins our fantastic food and drink industry, uh, all their ingenuity and hard work and traditions built up over literally hundreds of years. And that's why our agricultural policy and our, our wider food policy as well as fishing policy are aimed at protecting Scotland's food producing capacity. So TTIP, the international agreement which was just referred to, uh, is something we're paying very close attention to. We don't want the European marketplace opened up to cheap inferior beef imports, for instance, that don't have to meet the same standards as their own domestic production. And there's a number of other concerns over what potentially might come out of the TTIP uh, arrangement. So we are paying very close attention to that and making our concerns known to the UK government and indeed the European Commission. So I pay tribute to our primary producers, our manufacturers, our scientists, our innovators who are helping develop the new products which are getting out into the international marketplace, and of course to our entrepreneurs. The number of entrepreneurs in the food and drink industry just now is absolutely phenomenal, and they're achieving amazing things. Many of these companies are starting out small companies, just as the Walkers you know, over 100 years ago did, and they're going to be big companies one day, employing even more people uh, in this country. Last night at the Visit Scotland reception, those of us who were lucky enough to be there would have got to have enjoyed some honey from Plan B, another new small business in Scotland, IQ Chocolates, doing really, really well, the Wee Fudge Company, and Taste of Aaron, uh, Taste of Aaron who some members mentioned as well. All of these initiatives and companies are backed by entrepreneurialism and the talents of a few individuals who are very ambitious and dedicated and passionate, and we owe them a huge debt and are very, very inspirational. Last night's event, of course, did remind us that the food and drink industry has got a huge role to play in tourism, which is a wider economic benefit. The most popular visitor attraction in my constituency in Murray is Glenfiddich uh, Whiskey Distillery. And of course, again, many people will be familiar with the benefits of food related tourism in their own areas. And that's why next year, 2015, the year of food and drink, is again such a massive opportunity uh, for Scotland. 
So it's about exports, it's about tourism, people coming to Scotland. It's also about people here in Scotland being able to enjoy more and afford their own larder and their own doorstep. And that is a theme that's run through many speeches today uh, in this debate. We're trying to do some things to promote that. We've got Taste the Best, which is an accreditation of the hospitality sector in Scotland, the restaurants, the hotels. We were trying to say to the staff, explain to the customer where the food is from and put more of Scotland's larder on the menu. And if you do that, you get accredited with Taste the Best. And our public procurement policy is now reflecting the larder we've got on our own doorstep, as well as nutritional standards in our hospitals and our schools, and we'll take that forward. Food education, because this is all about our children and future generations. That's the real way to change our food culture in this country and food education is now playing a greater role than ever before and that's why children's food is at the heart and has a new focus in becoming a good food nation the next phase of our food policy uh, briefly yeah. Um, thank you. The Cabinet Secretary rightly mentions the emphasis on children's food within the document. It's very focused on the public sector. Does he have anything to say about the restaurant and cafe sector in particular, where there are real issues around range of children's food, portion size, the type of food that children are offered in those contexts? Uh, yes, I think the children's food policy has got to not just be about food education or schools, it's the private sector as well. Uh, as a father of two young children, I get immensely frustrated when I take my children out around Scotland or elsewhere, and the choice of the children's menu is either very poor or very limited and quite often inappropriate. And that is one reason why I'm very keen that the heart of the next phase of our national food policy is better children's food uh, in Scotland. Now, many people also addressed, as I reached my conclusion, the issue of affordability. There's a lot happening just now to reach out to many people in our community to give them more opportunity to enjoy affordable food. But you know, it is sickening, absolutely sickening, to witness millionaire Tories sitting around the UK Cabinet table in London, taking money out of the pockets of families in Scotland who now can barely afford to put food on their own tables. <clears throat> that combined with the proliferation of food banks in Scotland, which is a scandal in itself, is one reason why we do need welfare policy devolved to this Parliament as soon as possible. Yeah. Out in the Food Commission, which I mentioned we're setting up, I will ensure there are strong voices with people there who have experience of food poverty in Scotland. And that's what the Food Commission is going to be all about, looking at the big challenges facing our society, not just over the next 10 years, but beyond as well, whether it's food security issues, whether it's food poverty issues, or other issues as well. And we will appoint key people from Scottish society to the Food Commission to advise us, and there will be local champions in every community around Scotland taking forward the food agenda. So we have the vision to take Scotland forward. It's in the, the Good Food Nation document. I think we can all sign up to that. I close by saying that, as I said in my opening remarks, if in 10 years' time, People around the world or around Europe think of good food nations. They will think of Italy and France, no doubt, yes. But in 10 years' time, they're going to think of Scotland as well. And I commend the motion to Parliament. That concludes the debate on food and drink. We now move to the next item of business, which is consideration of five parliamentary bureau motions. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motions number 11583 and 11585 to 11588 on approval of SSI's on block. Moved on block. The question on these motions will be put at decision time to which we now come. There are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 11598.1 in the name of Claire Baker, which seeks to amend motion number 11598 in the name of Richard Lockhead on food and drink be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 11598 in the name of Richard Lockhead as amended on food and drink be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. I propose to ask a single question on motions number 11583 and 11585 to 11588 on approval of SSIs. If any member objects to a single question being put, please say so now. No one has objected, so the next question is that motions number 11583 and, 11585 and 11585 to 11588 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of SSIs be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motions are therefore agreed to. That concludes the decision and I close this business.